All right, everybody, welcome to a virtual bourbon event. This is our distillers panel, a discussion with five of the best distillers in the country. And I'm not lying about that. These are people that are dedicated to the craft. I think that's going to come out as we go through this today. I'm going to introduce each of them individually. And I've got three questions that I'm going to be posing to all of them as we go through there. So first up is going to be Lisa Wicker of Widow Jane in Brooklyn, New York. So the three questions, Lisa, that everyone gets asked. The first one is, how did you get into distilling? How did this become a career for you? Oh, you're not going to introduce everybody and then? No, no, we're going to go. We're going to do each one individually. Okay, okay. Um, gosh, um, it's a long, boring story. My grown children are like, you've got to come up with a, you know, like something that's a little bit more concise. In a nutshell, I um, was a, um, grew up around the, um, a dear friend growing up has a huge winery in Indiana and got my, my head around the idea that you could actually make alcohol for a living. And uh, got married, moved around the country, had three kids, moved back to Indiana, um, um, was in working in the arts. I had a costume shop for a professional dance company that I'd founded and was costume mistress there. I um, actually, I know it's hard to believe a million years ago, I danced with IU Ballet for 10 years. And so That's cool. that was my background. I circled back around with that um, and was able to work around my kids, you know, schedules and things. But it was, you know, either crazy because we were doing ballets or you know we didn't have any work so um um did some freelance writing through all of that to you know pay the bills and um a, a friend it was just a fluke had asked me if i wanted to be a farmhand for simmons winery in columbus indiana and i said yeah why not so i was one fall i was costuming a nutcracker and <laughs> and um harvesting grapes that kept going and going and going and so a few months later on um um a friend of mine that had been the uh, winemaker at Oliver's and I'd grown up with Bill Oliver right and and he um, um, had his own winery in Brown County and he bugged me a few times he knew I didn't we worked at the, the Department of Natural Resources years and years and years before he knew I didn't mind getting dirty or doing hard work and so he kept you know every time I was in the winery he's like you gotta come to work for me and one day he actually called me and said you know come talk to me and he, you know, I asked him later, like, why did you, he's like, I don't know. I just did, you know? And, and so, um, three days in, I'm like, oh my God, this is what I was supposed to be doing. <laughs> That's cool. And so anyway, long journey there, eight years, um, patched my education together, even to the point where I'd sleep in my rental car when I had to go to California to make ends meet. But I would take every, um, intensive I could at University of California, Davis, um, Purdue universities, their extension program, a little bit of Virginia Tech. And um, fortunately, a woman, Dr. Butts, Dr. Butts from uh, Purdue, uh, saw something in me. She was still, she's, gosh, I don't know how old she is now, but she still works for Lala Man Yeast, and she saw something in me and, and mentored me. And so, you know, I had, um, not only did I work for an insanely intelligent man, um, I, you know, had some other opportunities as well. And so uh, my youngest was getting ready to, you know, a year away from graduating from high school, um, with some people that we bought grapes from, and in uh, Kentucky came and said, you know, we're not gonna have grapes for you next year because we're gonna start a winery. And my boss offhandly said, Lisa's ready to go. You need to hire Lisa. And so I went down as their consultant uh, sitting at their kitchen table and um, they said, we'd really like to hire you as our winemaker. And I'm like, okay, which I tend to do before I think things through. like that means like selling my house in Indiana and moving to Kentucky and <laughs> You know, all those things. So I started commuting in April. My daughter started, my youngest started college in August, and I moved the same within a day or two of her starting. Um, the grapes came on quick and it was quite the ride. Um, I did started that in August and uh, met Steve Beam in October of that year and started working with Steve in the evenings. Um, because one of the things that my goals, I turned down a job offer in North Carolina, one in the Santa Cruz Mountains in California for winemaking, and um, I wanted to learn to distill. And so I'm thinking, I'm going to go to Kentucky. Um, they, they were not allowed to have a still in the wineries at that point in time. I wiggled my way on the legislative committee and thought I'd start working towards getting those um, laws changed. And um, during that time, started working with Steve in the evenings. Um, the owners of the winery were going through a very spectacular divorce. I saw the writing on the wall for the winery, booked a ticket to California because I thought, well, I'll work harvest in Sonoma, right? And and re come back to Kentucky and regroup at that point in time. And then Paul and Steve Beam took me to dinner the next 24 hours later and offered me a full-time job with Limestone Branch. And that's how that happened. And so I spent the next almost three years, 60 to 80 hour weeks, uh, doing a lot of client work, baptism by fire, 
um, all kinds of craziness. And, you know, in, the, in hindsight, I couldn't have asked for a better way just to jump off, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I was there three years until they, Flexco bought 51% of them. I was the second man. So, you know, I got fired during that. And, um, um, you know, I thought I was going to have to go back to winemaking, which I loved winemaking, but never as much as I've loved distilling. And, and um, fortunately for me, I had a full-time offer on the last official day at Limestone Branch, but it was in South Carolina. I countered with consulting. They said yes. And um, so I was consulting for them, another distillery that we all know and is um, made some incredible product and has an incredible presence in the industry. Got wind I was available. They offered me a job. I couldn't believe all this was happening, right? I mean, but right, yeah. craft distilling had just exploded. Craft distilling was just exploding. And so, um, um, you know, news traveled fast and I was getting ready to accept that offer. And uh, Ted Huber called me and said, oh my God, Lisa, don't, you know, I said, oh, Ted, I'm getting ready to accept an offer. He's like, don't until you talk to me. And I said, well, I'm meeting with them on Friday. He's like, come see me on Thursday. Um, there was a snowstorm. So I called the first people and said, you know, I, I need it. I need the weekend. And so I met with Ted and Dana and they knocked that offer out of the park, not necessarily monetarily, but uh, what I was going to be able to do. Mm -hmm. So, um, I was there a year and a half and, um, you know, distilling six to seven days a week. And, um, it was, they're just remarkably good people and thought I'd be there forever. And I was at a party at my daughter and son-in-law's in Bardstown. And, um, they since moved down here after I did and from Chicago and, and, uh, Drew Colson, the master distiller for Willett was there. He's like, Hey, Lisa he goes, what about coming back to Bardstown? I'm like, what do you got? Right. And, um, kind of jokingly, you know, and he's like, well, actually an old time, our old family friend went to build the first craft distillery in Nelson County. And so I'm like, okay, okay. So I flew to California and interviewed with them and it's like, okay, I'm going to do this. And so, um, I oversaw re renovating a 25,000 square foot warehouse for storage and bottling. Um, I, uh, took three tobacco barns and turned them into a distillery and had to extract myself from that project and didn't tell anybody why I left there. And I have two words now, tuition scandal. Um, they are part, they are, oh, okay. they are some of the people in the tuition scandal, right? And sure. um, we weren't lining up necessarily on our work, work ideas and ethics and that sort of thing. And it was, it was tearing at me. And so I had decided to leave there anyway. And and um, start my own consulting business. It was crazy when that news came out. I got a text message. Rosemary Miller um, actually is the first person. She sent me a text message. She's like, oh my God, Lisa, have you seen the news? I'm like, no, I haven't. And she was like, oh my gosh. So I was flooded with messages. Like, Mike Beach's you know, fiance for those. Who, yeah, yeah, why'd you leave that project, right? And so anyway, during that time, um, I had some clients in Western Kentucky. I had some other clients already lined up and Samson and Surrey called me. Robert Furness Rowe used to be the CEO of Bacardi. He's British and it, it, he's CEO of internationally um, and called me and said, hey, you know, I need somebody to move to New York. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I still got too much to learn in Kentucky. You know, I can't see myself living in New York. And um, he called me back. And so I walk into my living room and I have a half a bottle of Bren on the front. I've restaged it here. And I'm like, oh my God, I just, that's an omen. I just missed. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a huge omen. I just, I just screwed that up, right? And so he called me back. But before that happened, too, uh, Ted Hubert called me. He's like, Dr. Cressy wants to talk to you. Like, I'm like, Peter Cressy used to be over discus, right? You know? And he's like, I was like, Dr. Cressy, Dr. Cressy wants to talk to me. He's like, yeah. And so I was in boiler school. And he called me during boiler school. And he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I'm missing my class in boiler school. But um you know, we talked and he said, and, he, and that's how anyway, he connected Robert and I with the project. Cressy spends, Dr. Cressy spends his retirement at the library at Mount Vernon for George Washington. And he knew what I had done there and the influence I had on the program there. And that's why he threw my name in the hat for the project. And um, so anyway, so we went, went through that and um, um, Robert calls me back a few weeks later, five weeks later. And he's like, I'm flying, I'm going to fly to um, Kentucky. I'm coming to Bardstown. I'm taking you to dinner. And 10 minutes into dinner, I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to go to work for this guy. Right? You know, mm -hmm. I was like, oh man, he, he knows, right? He knows how persuasive it is, right? <laughs> but just for the opportunity and what he was laying out was going to happen with the vision for Widow Jane, um, you know, what we needed to clean up for its reputation um, and what was going to be laid out in front of us going forward and how that was, you know, um, it was going to, 
they were going to give me a lot of leeway. So I, we decided that I'd stay on it. I'd come on as a consultant because I'd already had other clients. Right. And so I came on working for them three days a week. Well, like, so I could spend two days with my other clients and then um, they, you know, a few months later, they asked me if I could dismiss my other clients. I did um, brought me on full time as vice president over all the brands. So that's few brand. Oh my gosh, Mezcal Vago, um, Philadelphia Distilling, and um, I was spending most of my time at Widow Jane. So they named me president and head distiller and blender a year and a half ago. So That's crazy cool. ride. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt, no doubt. Crazy ride. So yeah. I just bought this house in Kentucky. I've been waiting and waiting for a historic house. I live on the old distillers row in Bardstown, right? It's like my dream. And then the second I bought the house, you know, I'm living in Brooklyn mostly these days. <laughs> That's how that stuff works. You know. So uh, a couple other questions. And, and this is, I think the second one's the toughest one. Favorite of your products that you make? Oh my God. They're like, well, that's that like your like children. I get it. My I get it. Two son-in-laws, you know, my grandsons, like which one's my favorite? Um, they all have their own personalities. It depends, you know, I mean, I, I know that's kind of a, a cop out answer, but it really does. Um, the, I'm really proud of the five barrel small batch. It's sourced bourbon. I have to go buy those barrels, right? We have, we've got two different programs going on. We're laying down our own whiskey with our own corn, but then, you know, um, I had inherited this program and they were only, it was a single barrel, right? And um, in order to not drop the age statement, we discussed how not to drop the age statement to keep it at 10 years. And so I source barrels, Indiana, Kentucky, and Tennessee. And surprisingly it's one of the favorite things to do you know you know you come back out and you know get presented with all these lots and it's wheeling and dealing and playing a chess game about deciding you know what needs to happen and what barrels you want and do you want to buy some that are younger and wait on them or you know so that it's, it's it's actually a crazy lot of fun really and um but i blend i've blended 250 batches of that five barrels at a time wow and, um, it's a lot man. um yeah and it's been really well received and um you know, it, it ebbs and flows. There's always certain notes I'm trying to nail in. I'm always trying to nail our um, dark stone fruit. And I'm always trying to nail our baking spice. And outside that, everything goes, you know, anything goes. So, you know, I bought like some Tennessee that was 10, 11 years old, and it was drinking like a four-year-old, five-year-old. It's like, oh my gosh. And so I moved those barrels to a different rickhouse, and now they're almost accelerating too much. Now, <laughs> Oh my God. Okay. So we went from baby tasting to like almost Teutonic, but, um, but yeah, it's a balancing act and trying to get all that. So um, that's probably. That's your favorite. Uh, okay. No, no, it's my favorite. You know, I got to, uh, we're, we got to go with that. We got to go yeah, with that. It's a challenge. <laughs> all right. today, yeah. So, and, and here's another interesting one, favorite bourbon to drink besides your own. So nothing from your portfolio. Oh gosh. Um, as a reminder, there are four other distillers here. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's the reason I was thinking you should introduce first, right? No, no. Um, I'm, I'm just saying that when you may, it, we it, choose carefully there. Quite, yeah. quite seriously, it depends on what week it is. I get on different tears. You know, I want right. to like retaste everything from Four Roses. I want to retaste everything from Heaven Hill. I want to retaste everything from Beam. And I go in cycles where I'll go back and revisit all those because all of those are evolving too, you know. They're, they're not staying the same. So okay. anyway, that's so, a cop-out answer I'm going right. by. So I'll, I'll answer Jimmy White level is the answer then. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Alan Bishop, you're next, man. Spirits of French Lick, West Baden Springs, Indiana. How you doing, buddy? Not too bad. Yourself? I'm doing good, man. So, so the same three questions for you. How did you get into distilling? It's actually, <clears throat> it's kind of funny. Um, before I delve too deep into it, uh, I got to give props where they're due. So there are two people on the show uh, that, that in my opinion, made sure that I am here. So first and foremost, if it wasn't for Lisa, I would have never pursued Lisa. Yeah. being in this legal industry whatsoever. Um, that was on her and Steve Bean. So you can blame them. <laughs> Second of all, uh, I probably yeah, wouldn't have a very boring night and we had a great talk and then we've been friends ever since. <laughs> we did. Yes. Uh, second of all, Royce Neely is responsible for setting up the relationship between the ABV network and myself. So wouldn't be here without him. So I have to pay tribute to the two of them. Um, long and short of it is my background is in home distilling. Uh, I always preface that with read that however you'd like to. Um, you can read that as home distilling and or moonshining. Um, I grew up in a family of distillers, uh, some legal, some not so legal, Indiana and Kentucky both. 
Um, I grew up around stills. Stills were just a part of the environment that I was around when I was a kid. Uh, I remember being around copper pot stills when I was three or four years old. Um, wasn't any big deal. Uh, by the time I was 15, I grew up on a tobacco farm as well. So you could you could say that to some extent I was probably raised in vice. <laughs> it just is what it is and it's stuck. So, uh, you know, my family used that to pay property taxes and pay for Christmas between the tobacco and the alcohol, uh, more or less, uh, you know, lower, you know, mid-income, you know, factory workers, etc. Um, anyways, by the time I was 15, I got a little more interested in uh, distilling. And uh, my dad and my grandpa came to me and basically said, you know, hey, we'll help you build a little 10-gallon still, but we won't tell you how to do anything. You know, I obviously saw what they did and knew what they were doing. Um, but Fire the rules... Going. Right. Hold on. Let me let me close this door real quick. Penny's standing back here. Hold on just a second. I don't know what I think. Alan killed his dog. To be honest, because the dog used to. Work for All right. It's always a dog or the daughter or one of the no. two. We figured you off the dog because the dog never barks anymore. Uh, she's in the bedroom now. She's probably going to bark while I'm talking. Anyways, by the time I was 15, um, got interested in distilling. They basically said, "Don't blow your ass up in the backyard and bring us something when it's worth drinking." So. Uh, from there, that's kind of what what started the fire. Um, a little later on, I converted the uh, family tobacco farm into a produce farm. And uh, by the time I was about 25 or 26, of course, at that time, nobody really cared about anybody growing produce in the Ohio Valley because everybody and their brother and sister had a garden. And, uh, you know, you give away more produce at the farmer's market than what you actually sell unless you're selling a little bit of uh, something extra out of the back of your truck. So uh, that got me interested. And then you know, I started thinking, I've done all this plant breeding, all this unique plant breeding that is for organic open pollinated crops. Um, I couldn't even get the Amish to grow my seed. And, and Lisa obviously has heard all this stuff in the past as well, because that's kind of how we kick things off was with agriculture. But uh, so I started thinking, you know, distilling is agricultural. So what happens if we take this open pollinated corn we've been working on for a couple of years and run it through a still? Uh, what kind of flavor are we going to get out of that? What's it going to do? And by the time I was 26, 27, somewhere in there, I had a pretty good sized pot still in uh, mom and dad's backyard. And I had a fiance that wasn't going to put up with that much longer uh, because things were getting a little too, uh, too real when we were going places. Things were coming back around to us from people that we didn't know. And they're like, hey, you make some good stuff. Uh, and she basically, at one point in time, around the same time that I actually met Lisa Wicker, uh, she basically said, you know, you're going to have to get a job doing this or I'm going elsewhere. So mm -hmm. that kind of, that was a, a big part of the uh, impetus. At the same time, we were um, doing some work with a couple of the cast members from the, the Moonshiner show. Um, and through them, I met uh, Steve Beam and Lisa Wicker, uh, started hanging out with them a little bit. And um, at a bar in Louisville one night, started talking to Lisa. Uh, we were talking about different kinds of wine and odd fruit. I think at the time we were ta actually talking about the Luther Burbank white blackberry, which is literally what it sounds like. It's a white colored blackberry. So it's a conundrum. And, uh, she was working at a winery in Kentucky at the time and then got in with Steve. And then from there, you know, me, Steve and Lisa, I kind of hit it off with both of them and was living vicariously through them for a little while. You know, I text them, Hey, what are you guys up to? And, you know, Hey, we're just doing this or that or the other. And I think that just kind of clicked something in my head, like, all right that's cool. That's what I want to do. So I started sending out resumes to uh, every new distillery that was opening in Louisville, Kentucky at the time, because Indiana did not have uh, favorable distilling laws, to say the least, until a little while longer, um, <laughs> with the exception of MGP and Ted Huber. Um, this is a whole nother story. But uh, finally got a reply from Copper and Kings, and those guys brought me on. Um, I was the only person there with any distilling experience or whatever that was worth. I always say, I'm not sure they hired me for my experience or because they hired me basically because I was the cheapest possible option they could get at the time. But either way, it was a foot in the, the door. Way it works, yeah. yeah, it was a foot in the door and that's all I really needed. You know, I think there was, um, there were probably multiple phone calls to the, uh, the people that I knew that were in the distilling industry to say, Hey, how do you, you know, you go about this? How do you do that? Whatever. Um, was there for about two years, worked on the apple brandy, uh, the Butchertown brandy, and then also the absinthe were really kind of my babies at the time. Um, realized pretty early on that that was not going to be a permanent fixture uh, one way or the other, just uh, a lot of um, not seeing eye to eye with the ownership of that particular company. I love what they do and I wish them all the success in the world, but 
uh, I needed to get back on the Indiana side of the river because I'm a Hoosier at heart. Even though my family's from Kentucky, it was important to build that Hoosier history back up. Uh, get back on what I call the right side of the river. There's really no right side of the river. I just say that to, to mess with people. But um, Lisa helped me out again there. So she knew the owners of uh, French Lake Winery, and they were getting ready to um, – open up a distillery and they got my name from Lisa and from a couple other people in the industry. And uh, I was looking for a way out of Copper and Kings. And I remember it's uh, just like it was yesterday. I was driving down the road, uh, coming back from central Kentucky, picking up a load of grapes and trying to think about what I was going to do in the future. Cause I knew I had to get out of there. Uh, got a phone call from the owner of the, uh, the winery and said, can you come up for an interview? And uh, I tried to play it coy, but I'm sure that it came out of my mouth much faster than I thought it would. Uh, it, they could have paid me like $5 an hour, and I probably would have been back over here on this side of the river doing my thing, you know. <laughs> so uh, from there, you know, been working on Spirits of French Lake now for a little over four years and getting ready to roll out with a bunch of bottled and bond stuff. So That's very cool. Other two questions, favorite of your products to make? Uh, favorite one to make overall? Um, not necessarily to drink. Uh, I think really my favorite one to make, and I'm going to give you a kind of a twofold on this. My favorite one to make is honestly any of the botanical spirits, um, probably, probably absinthe, okay. um, because it's complicated. There's, there's even, even people, people discount botanical spirits and they really shouldn't. They're much harder to balance than what people realize that they are. Um, when I feel like I'm getting bored with distilling, that is the best possible time to throw me into a botanical distillation and no two botanical distillations ever go the same way. Uh, you fight with it to make sure that you're on profile all the time. So it's challenging as a distiller. And for me, that's a lot of fun. Um, the second part of that answer is probably the Hoosier apple brandy, just because of the history itself. So okay. bringing, bringing that back to the forefront is a, is a big part of what I do, not only, you know, in distilling, but also trying to write about distilling uh, and bring that Hoosier history back because we don't have Indiana and Illinois is the same way and, and, and stump. I'm sure you're seeing that, et cetera. Um, you know, we don't have the writers that they have in Kentucky you know, prohibition destroyed us. So uh, if you're going to really make a product in a state outside of Kentucky, unless it's, you know, Pennsylvania or Maryland or even Virginia, you better be able to back it up with some kind of history. Okay. He squeezed two in on his favorite. Did you see that? I did. That's good. I did. That's good. <laughs> it's magic. That's good. That's All magic. right. Alchemy. <laughs> Next up is uh, my buddy, Adam Stump, Stumpy Spirits, Columbia, Illinois, right across the bridge from my house. So, hey, Adam, how you doing, man? Hey, hey. So tell the group how you got into distilling. Oh, good Lord. Uh, <laughs> I'll paraphrase, I suppose. Uh, it all started, I was going to school um, for mechanical engineering down in the booming metropolis of Rolla, Missouri. For those of you that know of South Central Missouri, there's not a whole lot going on other than school and booze. So being a bunch of engineering college kids living in a house, we decided to figure out how to make our own booze. Uh, and basically ended up nerding out on the beer making process. We ended up with a brew stand that was automated. So we'd throw the ingredients in and basically make, make us a batch of beer and we'd sit there and get hammered on the batch from the week previous. So it was a beautiful circle of life for a bunch of college kids. Um, fast forward a couple of years, uh, I took a job straight out of school with Anheuser-Busch, go figure, keep the beer thing going, might as well. Um, spent four years there in roles between uh, operations, uh, logistics, capital engineering, all those types of things. Uh, while I was at AB, I uh, went back to school and was doing my MBA and forever sitting there at AB, you know, you could always see right up the, uh, the road, you could see the brew house and all the fun stuff going on, but kind of diagonally, you could see the abandoned Lent brewery. Steve, I know you're really familiar, Rick. I'm sure you guys Absolutely. are familiar with the, that view. Um, and I always thought, man, how cool would it be to put a craft brewery back in that old Lent compound? Like that would be so cool. So that kind of got me, uh, you know, the whole entrepreneurial itch took over and looked at doing a craft brewery and all that stuff. And um, while I was going, back for the MBA, I purchased a little five gallon moonshine still um, and started making booze in the garage. Uh, literally, I mean, my first distillation took 
50 milliliter samples from the first drip that came off to the last drip that came off, uh, just to see how flavors and aromas change throughout the course of a run. And from that point on, I was in love with distilling. I knew like, forget the brewery thing, it's, it, it's distilling. So basically throughout that MBA program, uh, more or less just try to figure out a way to, uh, you know, put it, put together a value added distillery for the St. Louis area. And the way we, um, we, we came up with was to include our eighth generation family farms. So I really spent that, the, the last part of that MBA program, um, trying to wrap the farm and the distillery into, into one really unique package. And actually, by the end of that program, Laura and I had purchased a distillery that was going out of business in Grand Junction, Colorado, and had trucked that thing back to Columbia, Illinois. And uh, yeah, now from there on, man, it's been crazy. We're on our, uh, I guess, fourth system since that one. So <laughs> always yeah, buying the equipment. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. You, and, you and Lenny, uh, yeah. <laughs> famous conversations with your wives, trying to get things approved. It's a, I see so many uh, similar things going on there. So, uh, so favorite of your product to make, Adam? Uh, my favorite product to make is by far the pre-prohibition rye recipe. Oh yeah. Uh, it's, it's my favorite to drink. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love that. I love it all the way around um, from, you know, the grain bill being rye, malted rye, and malted barley. Uh, the distillation process is completely different than any of our other spirits. The, the barrel we use is completely different than any of our other spirits. So I love that thing from, from front to back. All right. And who makes your favorite bourbon to drink besides your own? Oh, like everybody else, I'm sure it changes day to day and week to week. Um, I would say consistently, though, I go back to Heaven Hill a lot, a mm -hmm. lot. Um, I just picked up a bottle of McKenna Bottle and Bond and got to tear into one of those for the first time in about a year and absolutely love that. Um, and honestly, I feel like any of the Elijah Craig barrel picks, um, you know, store picks that I've seen recently have been absolutely amazing. So anytime I can get my hands on one of those, I'm always happy. All right. Next up is Lenny Eckstein from Deer Hammer Distilling in Buena Vista, Colorado. Hey, Lenny, how you doing, man? Doing good, Steve. Stoked to good. be here. Yeah, glad to have you here. So tell us a little bit how you got into distilling. Well, right up front, I'm going to say and let everyone know that I, I, I hardly remember last month. So I'm not going to be able to give you uh, a, a highly detailed account, but I'll do my best. That might make some stuff up. Um, you know, it, it was awesome actually hearing what Adam had to say, and I'll riff off a few things he had. But, but one thing that I find interesting um, you know, amongst distillers and learning about other distillers, it's, it's, it seems most common that um, folks come to distilling either from a science background, be it, you know, engineering or chemistry or something along those lines with that understanding uh, or the art background where I kind of came from. And somewhere in the middle, you need both. Um, and you could pull heavier on one or the other. But in my case, um, I have a background in visual arts and you know, right out of college, I was working as a graphic designer, um, doing a lot of just working for ad agencies, a lot of commercial work. Um, you know, s stuff that I, I, I had a passion for at the time, but it was getting old, just staring at screens and not making real things. I, I missed, there, there was a, a craft element that was missing um, because it was nothing tangible. And I found myself very drawn to processes. And at the time, I was in my early 20s, um, I was working for an agency that was down the street from a homebrew supply shop and I wandered in there and, um, th that, that began one, uh, passion of mine that just got out of control. Um, <laughs> I had a hard time. I, I wanted, I, I, I fell in love with it, you know, a few years in, and I, I was just enamored with the process with, with grain selection, fermentation, uh, even on this super small scale where you're making five or 10 gallons at a time. Um, and I pushed that about as far as I could before I realized, I think I want to do this. And uh, I had the opportunity to take a job at a brewery at the time. It was in Golden, Colorado. It wasn't Coors. Um, it's a very small spot called Golden City Brewery. And at the time, uh, one of their, their assistant distiller was getting ready to take off. And we were, we were making a batch of beer. He was deciding if I'd be a good fit. I was deciding if I had uh, the time and interest to do it. And while we were waiting for the sacrification rest uh, on a batch of beer. He started talking to me about how you can take beer more or less and turn it into whiskey. And uh, that blew my mind. 
and started me down a whole nother uh, path of me uh, finding a supplier of uh, steel heads that you could just clamp onto an old keg and put, and put on a burner and uh, make your own, you know, distillate at home, which, you know, obviously not legal. And the way I was doing it probably wasn't very safe either, but it was fascinating to me. And, you know, similar to what Adam said with regards to just collecting the smallest amounts and seeing how the flavor changes. And in my case, I was still brewing a stupid amount of beer and I would make 10 gallon batches where five gallons would get diverted to beer where I would boil, hop and ferment cleanly. Now I devote five gallons to an open ferment that would take off and, you know, take on any kind of lacto that might be in the air. And then I'd run it through a still. And that wasn't with intention of opening a distillery. It was with intention of having booze to bring to my office to share with all my nerdy coworkers and be like, check this out. This is, this shit, it's fun. And, um, I don't know. This is where it gets blurry. I really don't remember deciding to start a distillery. I, uh, my wife and I talked about moving from the front range of, you know, outside of Denver um, to the mountains. And part of that meant abandoning jobs that were readily available in the cities. And I ended up, uh, I don't know, man, I, I, I can't, that's where I can't really recount the details. We decided we're doing this. We're going to open a distillery. I'm going to um, try my best to, uh, put my spin on what I think an American single malt should be via all my efforts on the beer side to things. And that's what Deer Hammer is all about is uh, not just American single malt anymore, but really uh, delving into the processes of what's impactful and what brings flavor and quality and intrigue. And uh, I don't know, 10 or so years later, and that's kind of what we're doing. Yeah. So, and I know you do a lot of experimenting, but what's your favorite product to make? Um. I feel like that's an easy one. I mean, that's going to be our American single malt for a lot of reasons. It's really, it's our hallmark. It's what got this whole thing rolling forward so much. So to the extent that the recipe that I was doing in my garage is almost identical to what we're using now. Um, but I would say also a lot of folks aren't doing American single malt. I see a lot of opportunity there. And I think I love making bourbon and rye and our corn whiskey, but I think the process of making an American single malt, uh, it's less sloppy, man. I don't, sp I don't spill blobs of mash everywhere, especially with rye. That stuff's sticky and nasty. Um, I like the process of lowering where we separate the liquids from the solids. Um, chilling it is so much easier. So that was a long-winded way of saying uh, everybody should make American single malt. It's fucking awesome. So, <laughs> All right. Awesome. Uh, favorite bourbon to drink besides your own? Um, well, it, it's going to be, even though uh, I love what all the heritage brands put out and that's probably the majority of what I drink. I, I would, I'm going to have to go with a craft brand because I'm so inspired by the variation that's coming out of, you know, m my cohorts in Colorado and, and beyond. So I'll just name two because one's hard. Um, I've been drinking a lot of Leopold brothers, recent bourbon release. I uh, love the fruit notes going in, going on in there. And then another one that I'm quite fond of is um, the bourbon as well as the rye from distillery 291 the team over there is doing some really neat stuff. And I just, I love a unique flavor profile and both of those distilleries are they're, they're you know, real on that. hitting on that mark. Okay. Uh, last right. up, but not least Royce Neely, Neely family distillery, Sparta, Kentucky. Uh, Royce, how you doing, man? <clears throat> Good, Steve. Glad to be here. I have terrible allergies right now. So okay. you guys have to bear with me. So how do you get into distilling? 10 generations before you, it seemed kind of it's probably set before <laughs> you've been around <laughs> you took your my family, Steve, they're very open. All of them mm -hmm. to talking about, uh, uh, family history and things that happened. And, uh, so I grew up hearing all of that uh, from a, you know, at a young age. And, uh, I grew up about two and a half hours out of the mountains. My dad moved up here in 88. And so I grew up on a tobacco farm, but we would always go back for holidays and to visit family. And every time we go back, I still got cousins down there that make it illegally. We'd go over there and they'd show me the steel side, or this is where that took place at, or, you know, this is where this happened. And I just become infatuated with it really. So I, I fell in love with it. Um, and then what really uh, drove me is when I got into college and I left the country, because, you know, where I come from, a lot of families come from a moonshining or a small farm distillers background or, or things like that. So uh, I had never made anything on my own at that point. And uh, when I got into college, I was going to a small school uh, down in Lexington called Transylvania University. And a bunch of my buddies went to UK, which is right down the road. And I went to a party one night 
and um, just exactly how the guy said it to me. I knew this guy had absolutely no background in moonshining at all because we went to high school together. And he was just slinging apple pie moonshine gallons of it left and right. I mean, making what I thought at the time was making a killing. So that entrepreneurial spirit kind of took over. And I went up to him. I was like, Bryce, where you got your steel set up at? Because I'm like, how, you know, where the hell is this guy running a steel at in the middle of downtown Lexington? He's like, I ain't got a steel. Just buying Everclear, flavoring it, and selling it to these idiots. Exact way he said it to me. So <clears throat> I went back after that and started talking to my roommate. And I'm like, I can probably get – my Uncle Bones is just crazy enough that I can probably get him to tell me enough to where we can build a still and try this ourselves. So I knew my dad would pick up on it. So I called Uncle Bones. I started picking his brain and we started doing some research. So I built my first still about a week after that. It's crazy. You can build a still right out of Home Depot. So, uh, and some of my grandma's canning stuff. But anyways, so I built a still right after that. Uh, the plan was, is we could, I knew that we could make the whiskey a whole lot cheaper than what he was buying those uh, fifths of Everclear for. I was probably given 25 to $30 a fifth for that. So we entered the market very low. So we cut him out at $15 a gallon instead of where he was at at 25 on the apple pie. Uh, we were actually able to sell straight. Obviously, he couldn't because he wasn't making any of his own stuff. So once we eliminated him from the market, I was much more popular than him anyways at the time. I had a bunch of buddies of mine that were, uh, you know, not only baseball buddies, but other frats around UK. So, you know, it was very easy for us to, to do very quick distribution. And uh, we eliminated him from the market and then kind of flooded it as much as we could. So uh, we got pretty popular. Uh, Y'all been to my distillery, you guys know <clears throat> my mother, my father. Um, did not take long for my mother, who tries to figure everything out that I'm doing all the time anyways, uh, <laughs> to catch wind that uh, I'm slinging moonshine in Lexington left and right. So. Um, <laughs> she shows up on a Sunday. It was not a lot of fun. We just thrown a big party. Uh, landlord had called, threatened to evict all of us because we'd thrown three parties in a row that weekend. And when they roll in, there's a still set up right there in the kitchen. So uh, she tore into me and then she ripped my dad in front of me because she figured he had had to be the one that was telling me how to do it. He rips me. Uh, so they take the still back with them at the time. It's, I've still got it. It's a beautiful copper. It's the best one I ever built. Beautiful copper pot still. And uh, they took it back with them, which was disheartening. And uh, about two weeks later, I get a phone call from the old man. He's like, hey, got any more of that, that uh, apple pie shine that we confiscated from you? And I'm like, no, took the still. Don't have any more of it. And he's like, I was passing around with a lot of the dads here at the last uh, basketball banquet that we had. And uh, everybody really likes it. So I think I can move some of that for you if you can uh, make some more of it. <laughs> <laughs> so built another still. Started uh, distributing through <laughs> my father, and yeah, yeah. So he uh, he bought into it really quick. So at this time, I'm about to graduate from college. So I graduate. The plan was to go to physical therapy school. Did not want to be a physical therapist at all at this time, by the way. And uh, everything I was doing in college the last year, year and a half, was all moonshine related. Every, I mean, Becca's seen them. Every uh, project I was doing. I mean, it's hard to take a kinesiology degree and turn it into moonshining, but I found a way to do it in like every class for every project I was doing. So, um, I got out and I sat down one night. Uh, I just got accepted into, into PT school and I was like, this is not going to be a good decision for me. And I, I sat down and I, I wrote, I worked all night and I wrote a business plan up for what I thought could become a Neely family distillery. So taking our family history and then being able to bring it onto the bourbon trail. And I thought we had a great location where we were at because we're on the bourbon trail, but we're beside this NASCAR track down the road. You know, I, I grew up right around this area. So I took it to my dad. Uh, at the time I was working, it was the summer. Uh, so I was working with him. He was building barns on a big horse farm in Woodford County. And uh, I told him about it. He didn't even say a word to me. He didn't say a word all the way home, which was kind of weird. I just thought, ah, he thinks I'm an idiot. So uh, he comes back the next day and goes, call him and tell him you're not going to physical therapy school. It's like, I'm in if you are. I'll fund it. I'll build it. Call them and tell them. So I literally went through my emails, found the number, called the advisor and said, I decline. I'm not coming. So yeah. there you go. That was it. Yeah. So uh, I think it was probably it, me and my dad worked fast. So, I mean, it was two weeks later, we closed on a piece of property. And uh, about a month, month and a half after that, we broke ground on the distillery. So, and uh, That's cool. he was done full build out, full construction, probably within nine months. So we, it. we went straight at it. So I, at the time, according to the KDA, I was probably the youngest guy that ever filed a DSP at, I think I was 24 then. So crazy, 
crazy. Yeah, and of course, uh, smart as he is, uh, you know, the way he got caught was he quit asking for money from his parents at college. So his mom figured yeah. out what well, something's going on here. What yeah, college kid doesn't need money anymore? She was like, Roy, why? You know, is, is he selling drugs? <laughs> like, what, what is he doing down there? <laughs> and my dad called me, and I'm like, it's like, how are you eating down there? I'm like, everything's fine, Dad. You know, we're eating fine. So that's when they uh, yeah. started. Yeah. You thought you were being a good guy. Yeah, we weren't taking your dad's money because you didn't need it. But yeah. I work with my old man and you know, my dad is owned a construction company. I roof with my dad in the summer. I'm not going to take my dad's money and drink on it. Right. But I mean, if I make my own money. Yeah. There you go. I don't feel too bad about it then. So I would All like right. malt corn down in Lexington up on the roof and UK police would drive by and wave at me. I'd wave back. I'm in my underwear spraying my roof down. So the <laughs> fucking squirrels couldn't get to the malt and corn that I had up there. So that was the thing. So what's your favorite product to make? Uh, I love making my great grandfather's moonshine recipe. That's easy for me. It's, it just puts a smile on my face every time. So I can imagine favorite bourbon besides your own to drink. Oh, granddad, bottle and bond. There you go. It's a good everyday drinker for sure. All right. Well, that's our distilling team. I also need to introduce someone else here. Christy Atkinson is our chief creative officer at the ABV network. She's my associate. Hey, Christy, you want to say hello to everybody? Hey, hi everybody. So we're going to be taking turns asking questions to the team here. And, and again, not necessarily asking anybody specifically. You guys can just jump in and weigh in on our questions as you go. And then when Christy and I get done, we're going to turn it over to the audience. You guys can ask questions as well. Uh, first question up is, obviously, we want to talk about all the great things you're doing at your distillery and distilling and all those type of cool things. But obviously, there's been something very big going on, the pandemic. And what have you guys at your distillery been doing since all of this has gone down? I'll jump in. Brooklyn. Oh my God. Ground zero, right? Um, Brooklyn just surpassed Queens on um, the deadliest place in the United States for COVID. Um, we decided to close the distillery. Um, I had two products on deck that I had to finish. Uh, my boss called me and we were on the phone every day and he was gonna, letting me make the call because, you know, he's not in, in New York, number one. But um, I'm on the phone with him on a Sunday. I'm like, I'm closing the distillery on Friday. Monday, I'm like, I'm closing the distillery on Thursday. Tuesday, I'm like, I'm closing. I'm, we're going to get that product on the truck and we're going to close the distillery down tomorrow because things were so happening so fast, right? Mm -hmm. And um, in order to protect my staff, um, we've been in some, you know, some places that were hot spots, obviously. A few of you know this. Um, I'm recovering from COVID. Um, so the call was, I told my boss in tears, you know, I'm like, I feel like I'm calling this too early and I'm also feel like I'm calling it too late, you know? So um, I stood in the rain and watched that stuff go on the truck and we closed down, right? You know? Um, so we've got somebody going in every day, once a day to, um, we've got chickens, you know, Red Hook. We have an amazing view, like you know, a block away of the Statue of Liberty. We've got the view of Southern Manhattan, but it's a village. It's really not any different than Bardstown, Kentucky. It just happens to be stuck on the water. <laughs> Brooklyn mm -hmm. and um people are you know it's just crazy you know I got the neighborhood bar and the whole thing there and um um but uh, yeah we're right now trying to figure out how to open back up right and um so I've decided that um um I had some guys in bottling today because we figured out how to socially distance them and, and get some whiskey in the bottle to finish up because we keep getting orders crazy enough and um um, you know, but now's the decision. So I finally decided it's the second that I know that if any of my employees get sick, they could be, there's room for them in the hospital, then we'll open back up. Okay. But right now, this horror stories of people getting buried. One of my employees was walking to the grocery store. He couldn't figure out what the tents were for. They were a temporary morgue and, you know, and he turned around and went home and yeah, it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, in Kentucky, you kind of sheltered from it, you know, other than the fact that I had it. Um, I've been pretty sheltered here, so yeah. Yeah. What about the rest of our distillers? It's a, it's been sanitizer land for us basically. Um, we've uh, I guess we've done close to fifteen thousand gallons of sanitizer now, oh, no. um, with three people uh, in production, and the vast majority of that has been in seven fifty mil bottles. So it's been a lot, a lot, a lot of packaging, but uh, we've been able to get a lot of that stuff out there uh, at a really cheap price and uh, help a lot of people. We, we donated a ton of it, so I uh, feel really good about that. Um, also feel really good that we're going to be exiting the sanitizer business probably by the end of this week. Um, 
so it, it sounds like I know there's an ethanol plant up in uh, northern Illinois right now that's putting about putting out about 70,000 gallons of sanitizer a day. Uh, so it sounds like industrial supply is starting to catch back up. Uh, and then we're even seeing requests start to go down and all that stuff. So uh, very happy that sanitizer is going to be in the market and also very happy that I'm not going to have to uh, be the one to make it with my team. So uh, that, that there's been that piece. And then... Um, Steve, I'm, I, th I think you saw it. Uh, we've been working on the new event venue as well throughout this whole time uh, and are really kind of zeroing in on finalizing the plans for that and hopefully getting ready to uh, break ground in the, uh, in the next couple of months here on new event venue, winery, expanded tasting room, cocktail bar, all that fun stuff. So uh, between those two things and trying to keep the, uh, the column running, it's been, uh, it's, it's been pretty crazy at the distillery for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So same deal with stump. <clears throat> we have been, uh, sanitizing a lot. So, uh, you know, we're still, uh, running wide open with that right now. I think, uh, at the end of this month, we should be at around 60,000 gallons of sanitizer. Um, so we started production two weeks ago, uh, started, we were planning on making rye whiskey. So, um, we started back on, uh, on that production sale on the other side of it, which has been great. Um, we were already signed into a couple of deals with some companies. So that's kind of what we're cleaning up with the sanitizer, a lot like stump. I think we're starting to see some of it go down, which is great because I wanted to get back into, uh, into full scale, uh, distillation, uh, for beverage alcohol instead of smelling that horrendous ethanol and all that crap all the time. Uh, you, you really don't understand the difference between industrial and beverage alcohol until you start making hand sanitizer. So it's a huge difference. Um, so yeah, we're excited to do that. We uh, we had planned uh, before COVID uh, to double production again. So we've got uh, the equipment ordered and most of it in now. Uh, so that's kind of with all the sanitizing and the bottling, we haven't been able. But like, there's a thousand gallon mash cooker sitting outside my distillery right now. Uh, so we're looking forward to getting that stuff in, getting it set up, running. Uh, you know, new. We had to bring in new water lines and all kinds of different stuff, but uh, uh, new boiler. So we're looking forward to uh, hitting strong back on the beverage side hopefully as this COVID thing continues to go down. Yeah. I know, Alan, you've been focused on that stuff too, right? On the sanitizer and that for a while. Right. So we, we made the decision to make sanitizer pretty early on. Um, you know, we're, we're in a, a pretty rural community, not, not too different than Stump and, and Neely, obviously. So um, the team itself is divided between three counties and then potentially a, a fourth county as well through, you know, relatives, et cetera. So uh, we were taking care of four counties in Indiana, plus a little bit the uh, Marion uh, County Sheriff's Department, which is Indianapolis. Um, we were lucky enough that we had <clears throat> about 4,500 gallons of uh, GNS on hand that we made the first couple weeks that we were, well, months really that we were in business because it's the single most boring job on the face of the planet as any other distiller here can imagine or does know. Um, so we were able to put that to use making uh, hand sanitizer while also making whiskey and brandy, etc. cetera. Um, and then <clears throat> about three weeks ago, we decided that we'd take two weeks off and kind of try to let things pass a little bit. And the reason for that is that, you know, while I, I love whiskey and everybody at the company loves whiskey and brandy, it's not worth uh, risking anybody's life for it. And we do have a couple of people on our team that are immunocompromised, including my father, um, obviously, you know, the peak didn't pass and we're back at work now. So we're just being more and more careful in what we are, but, uh, you know, it, it's easy to talk about it on distillers level and on an industrial industrial level. And we did start up production again this week and I'm glad that we did, you know, I'd certainly miss being around my stills and being around my people. Uh, but I think the, uh, the two weeks off was a much needed, you know, to, to prepare for supply chain issues that might come down the line in the future, you know, here having a family farm, et cetera, making sure that we have food for our family and our friends, et cetera. Uh, but then I also, I lost a very close friend to COVID-19. Um, and then I lost another friend probably because of COVID-19. He didn't have it, but it certainly probably contributed to, what happened with him. And so that really kind of, you know, struck a nerve and I needed to get away for a couple of weeks and deal with that. So, um, we're back at it now. You know, we had planned on 2020 being the year of spirits of French lick in 2021. They still will be, they still can be as we roll out bottled and bonds. Uh, they just have to be in a very different way than they would have been prior to this whole thing. And we, we feel pretty confident that we can make that work. 
and uh, we can get these bottled and bonds out there and bring some joy and some happiness to people, you know, even if they are at home. So, right. And, so here's something, and, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, Lenny, I just wanted to touch base with him real quick. Cause I know for him, he's been able to maintain his business. I mean, obviously things are changed, no customers coming in and that type of thing, but you've been able to continue with whiskey production throughout this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, like we're, Deer Hammers in Buena Vista, it's a town of under 3,000. We're naturally very isolated. Um, you know, Colorado isn't allowing travel into the mountains right now. So it's a big, um, it's somewhat unfortunate, but it is what it is. So it's a big locals only scene. And uh, yeah, we're still making whiskey. We installed a new pot still, which we're super stoked on. Um, we've been spending a lot of time kayaking and mountain biking and, you know, just reflecting on stuff. Um, our typical season, as we're a tourist town, but it really doesn't get cranking until June anyway. So, you know, we're just kind of hanging in there and, you know, put blending ba barrels and making stuff. So, yeah, what it is. Interesting. So one question we had for all of you, what would you say are the cornerstones of differentiation that your business brings to the market? What really sets you apart? <laughs> Not everybody all at once. <laughs> I saw Lenny, like the expression on his face, like, mm-hmm. <laughs> right. We'll, we'll keep talking, I guess, because, uh, you know, where, where I left off, maybe. Um, you know, I alluded to it earlier, but, you know, with regards to deer hammer and why we decided to enter craft distilling and make whiskey was that it, we wanted to create an American single malt, a bourbon, a rye, you know, everything we make, we want it to have our own DNA on it. We want it to be different than everything else. So, you know, our approach is to look at the process, look at historical processes, look at guys are doing now that either nod to those or depart from those and, fi and find our own path. And, and a big part of that for us from day one was looking at grain bills and saying, you know, cool, corn. Well, what, what else can we do? What other kind of corns, corn is there? Or malt barley. Why isn't anyone using this, you know, uh, dark roasted or crystal malt uh, that lends a lot of flavor? Um, yeasts, what yeasts work? You know, just every aspect of the process. And what we've really, what we have become known for is just, uh, you know, being in left field and kind of surprising people and being flavor profiles that are, you know, just, just left to center outside of the boundaries. And, you know, that's fun for us. Um, there's a lot of spirit competitions out there and it doesn't always bode well for us because, you know, we enter a bourbon and it might not taste like a bourbon from Kentucky. We enter an American single malt. It doesn't taste anything like what comes out of Scotland. Um, and that's, that mirrors what's been happening uh, over the long, over the years in the beer industry where, you know, the, the styles have expanded so much. So, it's what we do, and I'm kind of looking forward to the expansion of um, styles, products that other people are putting out, and accept, like the acceptance from the consumer level of what, you know, what a bourbon can be. Because even though it's very constrained, you can do a lot of stuff with it. So, you know, that, that, that's what we're all about at Deerhammer. Okay. Lenny nailed it. I mean, playing outside of the 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 typical palette or the the preconceived notion of what a spirit needs to be i think is kind of almost where we land too i would say if i had to drill it down to individual things there are three things where we're differentiated uh, number one is being completely single sourced so we grow every kernel of grain that goes into one of our bottles uh, this year we've got of course number two yellow dent corn uh, we've got Bloody Butcher Red Corn, Jimmy Red Corn, we've got an open pollinated white corn and a hybrid white corn that we're working with. Uh, of course, our rye, uh, soft red winter wheat, and then um, we're growing barley that friends actually that are a lot closer to Alan than me are malting. Uh, Caleb over at Sugar Creek uh, Malt uh, custom nice. malts all of our barley for us and then ships it back to us. So he does a, does a wonderful job. So uh, definitely try to differentiate from the grain side. We've spent years now trying to find varieties that perform well both in the field and the distillery. Um, the other thing, Alan and Royce and Steve, I know you guys have all seen it and a few others, Kevin and Rick, um, is the still. So we've got a, a complete one-off still. Uh, it's, a, it, it's a design of our own. I think it's probably gonna be the only one that's specifically like that ever built, uh, at least by the manufacturer we treated the design to. Um, it's kind of a, a combination of a lot of different uh, 
concepts and industries, but largely draws from the uh, the the original coffee still, where we can pull a uh, pull a liquid fraction off as our product. And what that allows us to do is to really distill to a higher proof and get really nice separation while maintaining a boatload of congeners. Um, so basically, we don't lose flavor uh, getting that that good separation. Um, and then the third thing is yeast. So we've actually put into production two yeast strains of our own that have been captured on the farm. Uh, they were captured, oddly enough, about 200 yards apart from one another. One is super phenolic. You would expect if you're if you're making a beer like a Hefeweizen or something like that, that's super like clovey, uh, just everything you expect in that world. Really good for an American single malt, actually, uh, we found. And then um, the other one is the opposite end of the spectrum. It's fruity. It's it's it smells like. Uh, do you guys have ever smelled like? long leaf beech nut tobacco imagine mixing that with apples and that's what that yeast strain smells like it's it's crazy and those uh one came out of a mulberry grove and one came off of a blackberry bush in sinkholes that are right next to the distillery there so uh those three things i would say are the big differentiators for us okay. in the corn stones. yeah so uh i don't know a big factor for me has always been uh not thinking you know i've always been humble enough uh, to not think I'm too smart to not learn from somebody else. So especially when I, I love being able to pick the brains uh, of retired or aging distillers. So uh, Ed Foote, Dick Stoll, uh, you know, Jimmy, a lot of these guys. So I've, I've never been, you know, thinking that I can't learn something from these guys or what they're doing is not the correct way to do it. I've also never uh, thought that I was not smart enough to know that the bounds that constricted them could not be pushed farther. So I think that's something that unites a lot of us as well you know, the distillers that are on here. So I, I love employing a lot of old school techniques. I triple pot distill. Um, <clears throat> I utilize a thumper. I'm like, you know, it's, it's an old way of utilizing a thumper, but as far as I know, as far as me and Alan's talk, there's nobody else in the world that does that uh, like the way that I do. So I focus more on, uh, you know, the quality side of it. And I really don't ever rely too much on crunching the numbers to know, uh, you know, how we're going to do on the quantity side of it or, you know, how much money we're going to make off this product. To me, it's always been focusing on the palate um, and you know, what type of uh, flavor profile we're going to get off of what we're making. I love working and you guys know that I work my own yeast. Uh, we're going to move into a full scale production of only working our own yeast with an old school Donner room that Dick Stowe designed for me. Uh, so, I mean, that's being built right now. The, the jugs are already in. Um, so we're going to be able to grow, uh, or probably get enough yeast to work about 1200 gallons a day. So that's going to be really cool. Um, I like, uh, messing with different types of barrels as well. So seasoning or toasting. Uh, for different periods. Um, I think that changes the way that the whiskey ages over time. So uh, definitely focused on that. And I, I really love now that I'm starting to get some of this, uh, this whiskey out and uh, get it to the market. I love seeing what kind of profiles I can get off of young whiskey. So it's, it's always funny to me that people knock young whiskey when there's great young whiskey and there's terrible young whiskey. Just like I have 15 year old barrels out there that I do for source clients that I wouldn't give a dollar for that barrel. So it's not funny. Lisa, the, the, the uh, Tennessee stuff, you talk about it gets very tannic very quick so you know there's uh some of that stuff out there that's great and there's some of it's terrible so just age doesn't to Absolutely. me age doesn't matter at all it's a part of the equation but it's not the whole equation so yeah um yeah. us i'm um i've been challenged with keeping the craft and craft and scaling up and jonathan swinney's on here from luckett and farley jonathan is the best if you need a guy jonathan's your guy um but we're, we're um, expanding the distillery in Brooklyn. We're building a new distillery in Brooklyn um, and trying to repatriate everything there. So right now we're trying to bring everything to scale. So um, I'm growing corn in three states. The last two years we've had the largest crop of open pollinated heirloom corn in the United States for whiskey. Um, we are working with some agronomists to be able to grow it in a more traditional manner, but with um, um, financial scale in mind as well. And so. Um, this baby Jane corn that we have trademark, which is a cross between Bloody Butcher and Wapsi Valley. Um, you know, we're pushing the envelope at 80 to 83 bushels an acre right now, right? And so it's making a little bit more cost effective for us and um, more, you know, a viable option going forward. And um, so I'm growing in Kentucky. I grow in upstate New York and I grow in Pennsylvania. Upstate New York is production corn for, that goes to New York that we're distilling in Brooklyn. Um, I've got seed corn in New York. I have a backup seed corn grower in 
Pennsylvania just because of, you know, hail, locust, acts of God, right? I've got a one of a kind corn. I got to be sure I got a <laughs> business plan based off that corn. So um, I've got seed corn in two places. And then Kentucky, Peterson Farms, they grow for Maker's Mark, they grow for Sazerac, they grow for Heaven Hill. And we're the first craft project they said yes to. They had 20 some craft distillers come to them, but because of the scale, they were interested. And Bernard, has, Bernard Peterson has a daughter that lives in Manhattan. He's like, oh my gosh, when I first caught him a couple of three years ago, he said, uh, you know, I'm actually going to be out to see my daughter. And so he and his wife and brother-in-law and sister-in-law came to the distillery and 10 minutes in, he looked at me and goes, I got to talk to the family, but I think we're going to grow your corn. And so I'm laying barrels down in Kentucky like crazy. My boss has paid for me to do a takeover at Castle and Key. I use my protocol, which I cook a lot colder and longer with heirlooms because I don't like corn oil, right? And so um, um, I'm using my protocol. Uh, we use our corn, we use our yeast, and I use the Castle and Key staff. So I'm back and forth between New York and Kentucky overseeing those because anytime we're running, I've been running some rye and um, needless to say, our corn. And um, so I'm back and forth overseeing that. And then I go back up to upstate New York. Um, we're known for our one-of-a-kind water, uh, cave water. It's pretty controversial, right? The previous owner, for some reason, didn't stick to the real story, which the real story is just as charming as the fake story. So anyway, we've got that all cleared up and our labels reflect that. And um, I'm up at the cave a lot, checking on water quality, right? Because we do something different. We don't mash with that water. We actually proof the, proof the whiskey down with that water. Um, it's, uh, um, when I broke the water recipe down, the minerality on it is really close to a couple really popular mineral waters. Um, it is a pain in the ass. It, um, <laughs> like, it, it ca causes the whiskey to want to flock. We don't chill filter. Um, so polish, that was one of the first things I was tasked with is like polish this whiskey up, right? But don't chill filter it. And so we've got that process down. It's proprietary. It took a hell of a lot of phone calls and friends and scientists and laying awake at night trying to figure out how to do it. And we finally, finally pulled it off. But um, so one of a kind water, one of a kind corn, right? Trademark Baby Jane and one of a kind barrel, Zach Cooperage. Um, Zach Cooperage, Bert Zimlick started it. He was at Brown Foreman Cooperage. Um, he took over the old Atherton,ville distillery, which was an old defunct Seagram's plant. Um, and he was uh, raised, they were raising 60,000 barrels a year for Heaven Hill. His um, son goes into the business, Bruce, and then Zach, his grandson is now there as well. And um, Heaven Hill cut the contract overnight. So they were going from 60,000 barrels to zero, right? And so I was building a distillery in Bardstown. Somebody um, so gave them my phone number, said, you know, you might want to talk to Lisa. And so we had lunch. They didn't know anything about the craft distilling world, right? So um, I just got lucky that I was the closest person to call. And so, um, you know, we started talking about that. So my thank you gift is I have a one of kind barrel finish, right? So I have that one of kind water and one of a kind corn, one of kind barrel finish. The other thing is, my other thank you gift is I'm always first in queue, no matter when I order. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I love that part, right? So on the planning part as well. And then I just released a 14 and 15 year old last year, the vaults, and it was pretty well received. And I had taken some of that. Those guys were sitting on my front porch here and we were drinking some whiskey and we we're just talking about stuff. And people are like, oh yeah, we've got this eight year old air season wood in the back a lot. I almost fell out of my rocking chair, right? <laughs> like, okay. I said, can raise, raise some barrels for me, please. And so they called and like, we can't get them to 53s. It's too brittle. We can only raise 30s. And so I, I finished some of that in a 15 year old whiskey. It was, a, um, it was a blend of Tennessee and Kentucky. And I finished some of that off in, those, in that eight year old year since mm -hmm. so anyway. Dumpy, you're using that eight year old too, aren't you? Yeah, we are. We laid down um, four different recipes in it. It is. It's, yeah, it's it's pretty phenomenal when it talk, when it comes to making single barrels, like we're pulling, we're we're testing from like I think I've got some now that's about to turn two years old. They're yeah. completely unique, but they're it is, unbelievable. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. 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 There's yeah. no tannin left in it. It's yeah, it it, it it's crazy. It's, it's, I, you like seeing those barrels in the Rick House, Like I mean, you can tell that they're different. It's like this wood was like. It, it was almost rotten, you know, not, not that was yeah, no, 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 you're right. <laughs> it's so much darker than the rest of those barrels. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And I was like, Zach, what, what else can you do with this eight year old stuff? Wood. Just so you know, they were going to get rid. They didn't know what to do. They're like, we, you know, we got this on wood. We don't know what we're going to do with. Just so you know, I saved yeah. that old for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Zach, what else can we do with this eight year old stuff? He's like, let's make some zebra barrels out of it. I'll do some like 24 month air season. We'll do some 36 month air season, some eight year. So I've got like zebra barrels out there as That's well. Awesome. We can go through and That's pluck awesome. from them. But I yeah. Love 
I love that. And then I was going to say thanks to my buddy Stump down there who provided us with the seed this year. We're going to be growing some uh, bloody butcher on the family farm. So we're really looking forward to that. If all, you know, if all the live or the livestock, the animals, the uh, wildlife does not eat all of it. So yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're going to clean that up. Uh, I think next week we're slated to, to clean bloody butcher. So headed to Kentucky. I have to say it's team. really unique that you're using that Jimmy red corn. I didn't know a lot of distilleries were outside of high wire. Yeah. We, uh, we got our hands on a little bit of it um, three years ago and have really just kind of been uh, mostly growing seed stock, putting it back, regrowing and all that stuff. And uh, we're able to just start production on that after last fall's harvest. Nice. Yeah. Alan, I'm, I'm, before I move on to the next question, I, I do want to have everyone weigh in on that one. Your differentiators and then we'll get to the next question. Right. So <clears throat> two things I think are very important. So the very first thing uh, that everybody in this group represents is that alchemy is always equal to quality over quantity. And we live in a great time <clears throat> to be a craft distiller. None of us are really doing anything new. All the things that we're doing have been done by farm distillers, but those farm distillers did not talk to one another. All right. So Lenny, Lisa, Royce, Adam, what a great time to be alive as a distiller to be able to, to listen to what other distillers are doing and be able to talk to other distillers and learn about what they're doing. And we're all willing to share with one another what we're doing and raise the craft to a level it's not been to maybe in the past. Uh, and we are nowhere near the pinnacle in my opinion. So uh, for us at Spirits of French Lick, there's a lot of things uh, that make us different that we, we try to focus on. The first thing is that we're small, just like everybody else here. So we can turn on a dime, right? We like to think of ourselves as the uh, pharmacopoeia of distillers. So we got something for everybody. May not fix it, but it'll make you forget about it for a little while, right? It's very much a ready, fire, aim philosophy. So we don't know what's going to stick to the wall. We don't know what's going to work. We do all of it. You know, everything's got a different audience. There's a dynamic market out there. Millennials are not the same as, you know, the generation before. They don't tend to buy the same thing over and over again. But if they buy one thing from you that they like, they'll probably buy other things from you because it has your brand name on it, right? The brand at this point in time is almost worth more than the product itself is as long as the quality remains good. That's the whole trick to the whole thing, in my opinion. So for us, it's a little bit of what everybody else said. Uh, you know, we... One advantage I feel like that we have is that, and it's also a disadvantage in some ways, we are on, quote unquote, the wrong side of the river. You know, Kentucky is bourbon territory, and I love Kentucky to death. My family's all from Kentucky. I obviously love what Royce is doing. Um, you know, but the nice thing about being on the wrong side of the river is that we're allowed to do things that we wouldn't be able to maybe necessarily do if we were on that side of the river. You know, in fact, it's good for us publicity wise if we do some things that set us outside of those boundaries necessarily. So uh, being able to do aquavit, being able to do gin, being able to do single malt, being able to do a, a American style pochine, et cetera, uh, that sets us apart a little bit. You know, using alternative yeast, going back into Indiana history, pulling different characters from Indiana history, putting them on bottles, uh, going to old distillery sites in the state of Indiana and pulling traditional yeast strains. Uh, you know, some of these old distilleries that I study and I write about, you're lucky sometimes if you find even a grave marker for the distiller uh, that is recorded in history. Um, you're lucky if they were even recorded in history. So being able to build that back up is a big deal for us in southern Indiana. Uh, like Lisa said, and Adam and uh, Lenny, et cetera, Royce, growing odd heirloom grains you know we have access to the 30 acre farm in martin county where we've been growing a grain uh, a corn variety that i've bred myself over 12 13 years now uh, you know my blood sweat and tears is in that i literally the first few years that i grew it i harvested it all by hand you know I, I grew eight acres of it here on the farm and i literally harvested every single ear of corn by hand from eight acres which is a giant pain in the ass uh, which didn't pay any dividends whatsoever other than the fact that it's now in production and we can make whiskey out of it. Um, so those alternative yeast strains, those different corn varieties, the alternative grains that we're using, you know, buckwheat and kasha and oats and uh, things that haven't really been seen in distilling for upwards of 100 plus years, uh, using alternative barrels. You know, again, we use Zach Cooperage just like I know, uh, you know, Royce does um, and Lisa does. We're doing exclusively number two charred oak barrel which changes the profile of the whiskey completely because number two char gives a lot more lignin a lot more uh toasted coconut toasted oats 
uh, et cetera, uh, to the profile of the whiskey. And then having very differentiated types of aging. Um, you know, we have two different warehouses. One is a chai cellar. It's very much like a brandy cellar, very high humidity. Uh, temperatures fluctuate 30 to 40 degrees throughout the year, but it never stops moving. We also have a, a almost traditional dunnage, but it does have a concrete floor with ventilation all the way around, high temperatures of 115, et cetera. Um, you know, it's, that's what's fun. For me as a distiller, it's the same reason why, even though I don't own my own distillery, it's the same reason why I wouldn't take a job at one of the big distilleries, although I do love all the big distilleries, particularly in Kentucky. Uh, I would be the most bored and miserable person on the face of the planet if I had to go in every day and just had a checklist. You know, here's what you do all day long. Right. I don't want to do that. I would rather play for the minor leagues and have a few really good plays here and there uh, and be remembered for that in the long run and be able to create something from scratch, from the ground up uh, for the – southern territory of indiana basically uh than to go work for one of the big companies and just be a name amongst names right so okay i think christy and i both have one more question then we got a, like a speed round coming up but uh for the next question that i've got and royce kind of touched on this one already a little bit young whiskey that's a, a phenomenon that is uh, me as a long time bourbon drinker i've been drinking bourbon over 30 years, legally even. Uh, so uh, you know, it's a benefit of being an old guy. But I've always liked bourbon, and I was trained by Big Bourbon that you love age statements. And older whiskey equals better whiskey. That's that's what you learn. Um, you know, now now they're trying to go back on that, of course, as age statements begin to disappear and all that. But this phenomenon is is just shocking to somebody like me who's always looking for older whiskey, thinking that's the better whiskey, that the whiskey today can taste so good so young. So really geeky distiller's question, what is leading to this? Why, why now can we drink a whiskey that's a year and a half years old or two years old and it's phenomenal? How does this happen? Good whiskey, it, whiskey is good whiskey. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it, you can't, you know, I was talking about keeping our age statement. Um, we have, you know, we do part of that because of marketing, right? You know, we have a, we have a following. We've got a cult following for Widow Jane and, and we have to keep that. But, you know, we, I'm looking at some stuff that's just a couple of years old and we're talking about, letting it go, you know, I thought for sure I was going to keep it a little bit longer, but if it's good whiskey, it's good whiskey, you know, it, yeah. I think it comes from pushing those bounds as well. Like, you know, <clears throat> it's distillation method. It's you know, the type of barrel you're selecting. It's that grain that we talked about. I mean, younger whiskey, like uh, we pulled with a barrel the other day. Do I think it uh, could have set longer? Yeah, absolutely. But you taste the oatmeal and it's so forward that it was great at the time. So it's for what it is at the time, you know, it's going to be awesome because of that profile that it brings to the table. As it ages further, it's going to, the barrel is going to take more influence on it and things are going to change. You're going to taste that grain as much. If everything is made the same way, like it was traditionally for the last 80 years off of a Kentucky beer still, then age statements and letting it age longer uh, play more of an effect because we're making a very cheaply made product early on. We're leaving all of these impurities and things inside of it. And then we're going to allow a barrel to correct that over time. Uh, and when you change things up and go and use those old school uh, methods more, uh, you start getting that more pre-prohibition era type of whiskey, which was coming to market at two and four years. I mean, it's why there's a bonded period, a ball and bond at four years old. Yeah, Royce, Royce hit the nail on the head right there. I think still design is a huge, huge portion of it. I mean, nothing against Vendome at all. They make some of the finest equipment in the world, but whenever – the vast majority, say all the whiskey, is run off of a Vendome column that's set at three and a half PSI at the base of the column, and the doubler set at 90 degrees Celsius, and you know all these other set points are at these very specific ranges on automated equipment. There's only going to be so much variation, and you know those set points are tuned to, uh, in, in a lot of cases, efficiency. So I think the onset of craft distilling and actually putting that word craft into craft and, you know, people like Royce and Alan running pot stills and make and Lenny and from, you know, making their own cuts and, you know, making a whiskey that specifically suits their flavor profile. That's going to be the, the name of their distillery and, and Lisa picking barrels that are specific on two notes and then variant on the rest. Like, I mean, that's the difference in picking young whiskey right there. You know, those are the things that are going to add up to, uh, to, to be in a, a higher quality product at a younger age. Yep. I, I, I run the same whiskey, you know, that, that I'm running on the column at Castle and Key. I run the same corn in Brooklyn on a pot still. 
right? Right. And, um, some of that pop distilled whiskey, I can, you know, we actually, I inherited this part, but we actually released some of it at a year old, mostly so just sold, sold in the distillery only, mostly so that the consumer can get their head around what we're doing for the long term. So they can understand the difference. We can explain to them of the difference about an heirloom corn versus, you know, a yellow dent corn. And we have two or three different expressions from two or three different types of corn. And we release those early. Um, they're educational, but people are always surprised. They're like, well, this is good. You know, it's just clean. It's simple. It's sweet, you know, um, but that's all pot distilled. But it's, you know, it's so, the part of, part of what I love is the fact that I get to call them distill and I get to pot distill. But, you know, same, same as what Adam's talking about too, you know, is about making the cuts and, you know, um, um, you know, but it's, it's just, it, it, like I said, good whiskey is good whiskey, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. I, th- I think the cure and the cause are one and the same. And what I mean by that is that craft distilling got a really bad name early on because there were a lot of people who got into the business who had money to get in the business and no business being in the business. And at this point, they have figured out how to distill because they've had some practice. And other than that, people who are very pra- very passionate about the business and very passionate about the product uh, have managed to get into the business since then and these are people who had some distilling experience right you can't know what you don't know so you know royce you're a good example right you grew up in the, in the family just like i did uh that was around it so you may know two thousand ways to make really bad whiskey right but you probably know right we probably know three or four really good ways just like adam and lenny and lisa etc to make really good whiskey you know and it's being able to suss that out it's having that experience and and for us there was no outlet. There was nowhere that you went to learn this unless one of the big guys brought you in or you did it on your own and you figured it out on your own. And let me be the first to tell you that uh, as somebody who was making a living off of a farmer's market, if I had to rely on just selling produce, I'd have been broke and hungry and not as fat as I am now. But luckily I figured out how to make whiskey and I figured out how to sell it (laughs) and it was good. So one thing, Alan, that I absolutely love about distilling, and I've always loved it about it, is it does not matter how much money you spend on equipment or a distillery or a great marketing team for this whole story. It doesn't matter how much money you spend. It does not mean your product's going to be very good. Yes, sir. I, I was telling Becca the other day, she was in there, and we were, we, so we won that gold medal at San Francisco. That was the fifth barrel of bourbon I ever made, and I fermented in, in a plastic fermenter. <laughs> yep. Some of the best whiskey I've ever tasted in my life has come off of a keg still. Yeah. Truthfully. I ran it in the most untraditional way ever where I mashed in the same steel, pumped it over into a uh, plastic fermenter that I had at the time, added water into it. I mean, you know, something that anybody in a large distillery would have said, this is the craziest or stupidest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. It turned out great. <laughs> right. and it's two years worked. old. And yep. I tell people, like people look at those old steels I got in there and I'm like, you know, I made just as good a whiskey on that old copper pot as I ever made on that you know, expensive thing I got back there right now. So yes, sir. I, that's what I've always loved about it. It doesn't matter how much money you throw at it. You can make great whiskey in the backyard, phenomenal whiskey in the backyard with something that you built yourself. Yep. And a little intuition. That's all it takes. A lot of, yeah, a lot of intuition. Lenny, you want to weigh in on uh, younger whiskey? Why it tastes so good? Yeah, yeah man. Well, well, it doesn't always, obviously. And as right. said, it's <laughs> right. pretty well-made whiskey the cuts have to be right like you know all everything has to be right but but something that's a little different i think in our region you know we're we're at eight thousand feet in colorado that's that's a far cry from the environment in throughout kentucky or overseas in areas like scotland you know, right now i just checked we're at 11 percent humidity and our pressure systems are out of control extreme so you know we, our, our angel share is over 10% a year. It's upwards of 13%. It's stupid. Like, probably doesn't make sense. We should probably put a humidifier in. But I like, I like the impact of living in the mountains on our whiskey. And, you know, I, I've mentioned it before recently. We've, we've opened some barrels and realized they're bone dry. And, you know, how long – well, for us, how long can a barrel sit? It, I mean, at five years, it's half empty. So – you know, I, I don't really have an answer to that. But furthermore, for us, a big component is letting the grain shine through. And I think a lot of people are doing that by working with grains that have really cool flavor quality. We're not relying on this standard of, uh, like, I'm not quite sure where the uh, 75% of a bourbon's flavor came from the barrel. Maybe that's based on 
lab analytics, and they're like, well, the Vanillins and everything. We brink made that up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> trying to keep us going. Trying to keep us going. Azurak is where that came from. <laughs> Sazerac, exactly. Sazerac. Sazerac. I mean, I don't know what percentage, but but I do know that, you know, like, the, we, we've got uh, a barrel of six year old single malt right now, and it's fine, but I like our two to three year single malt better because the grain profile comes through. It's got more character. It's yeah. less like muddy down. When so, it's done right, yes. Yeah. yeah, so and, it, yeah. Well, you put a high number on there and it looks great. People are used to that, but that's not really what it's all about. We're finding that out. And Lenny, that, that angle share is something that you've got going that I, that I also have going. I bet Stump and Royce probably do too. That gives you a lot of retention and concentration because I know in our Rick house, I, I joke about this on tours, I get about 7% a year, which is enough to get me fired from any big distillery in Kentucky whatsoever. You know, it'd be, what the hell are you doing? You know, but what we're doing is we're concentrating those flavors, those grain flavors, and we're esterifying them in a very different way than people are used to tasting them. And I think it sets us all apart in a very big way. Jerry Dalton told us that too, Steve. Like when he mm. went to select a great barrel out of the Rick house, he wanted to try to find one that had the most angel share possible. Yep. Because more interaction took place. It's also been more oxygen to be, you know, been introduced inside of it. Right. So like he literally only selected single barrels based on at least the, the prefab for it was off of how much evaporation took place from the angel share. Those are my favorite for my like fifth barrel in my blend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. A lot of character. Lisa, uh, real quick, uh, this is kind of an aside, but like up in New York, what kind of evaporation do you guys get in your warehouses? Because it's got to be different. We're right on the water. So, but oddly, so we're like scotch. We lose proof, right? Which right. Is, yeah, you know, it's crazy. And so even up and down the Hudson River Valley, I'm looking for property, you know, up and down, up and down there somewhere um, um, to store more barrels and, um, you know, Hill Rock, all of those places, they all lose proof. I thought maybe that was far enough inland um, that would make a difference, but it seems to be, I really don't know this central New York and western New York, but the whole eastern part of New York, we all are losing proof. So it's, so it's so weird because I've got barrels in one state that are gaining proof, I've got barrels in another state that are losing proof, you know. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so managing it's kind of nuts, but yeah, it's a good question. All right, Christy, one, one more question before we get to the speed round. What do you got? So... We come um, across this topic quite a bit on our distillers talk show and Lenny kind of hit on this a little bit talking about some production issues. What are some of the challenges that each of you face in your job? Even looking beyond the production issues. <laughs> mine's making cuts. You're going to book on that, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, mine's just making cuts every day. So day in, day out. I mean, Alan talks about it a lot, but sometimes I'm pissed off. It happens. I right. come in there, I'm mad. I mean, sometimes lot. I'm in a bad mood. Right. And, right. Um, you know, I try to, literally, I try to calm myself down before I go over there to make a cut off of that still to where I, you know, bring myself back to that same mode where I'm making those cuts consistent every day. Because unlike a column where you flip a button and it makes it consistent every time, uh, you know, mine's dependent on when I decide to make that cut. So um, I try to avoid eating spicy foods and, you know, I mean, it's just about trying to maintain and keep flavor drift from happening because the biggest difference in a pot and column to me is although the column throws a lot of impurities in, and in my opinion, makes a much more low quality product. Uh, I'm talking about a beer still, by the way, beer column. Um, it, it, yeah. Yeah. I was saying make a, a beer column I'm talking about, which most 99% of columns are, um, you know, although it does that, at least it does make a consistent product that helps to make it more replicable. Uh, for me, you know, if I flavor drift over time or <clears throat> I mean, anything really could happen to me, you know, I burn uh, taste buds off or I don't know, I get a sore in my mouth to where it burns more that day. I'm going to make a different cut off of that still. And it's going to change that flavor profile up on that product that I'm making. So for me, it's just trying to maintain that. I think trying to maintain that profile off of a pot still. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Royce on that. The the thing about pot stills is that, you know, you don't create consistency. You manage it over time by blending your barrels together. My biggest, my biggest issue is really, uh, I am my own worst enemy. So I get stuck in my own head, um, a lot. And it could be anything from making cuts on a daily basis, uh, to, you know, honestly, while I love my job, you know, there's sometimes there's days that you, you would rather be doing other things, 
uh, or maybe you're struggling with something or whatever, or, or even, you know, nowadays you have to be your, your, you have to do a lot of your own marketing as a distiller. Uh, and there, there are days that that's not necessarily easy. There are also days that obviously when I'm on, uh, I probably drink a little too much and, uh, pay the price for that. So, you know, or you worry about, you know, even, even just stupid little things just get stuck in your head. You know, maybe, maybe something was bothering you and you, you know, there's been multiple times I've done this and, and I'm sure that I'm not the only one on this show that's guilty of it. You know, maybe, and this has nothing to do with spirit quality, except for it gets in your head. You drink a little bit too much and you said something you shouldn't have on Facebook and you wake up in the morning and you're like, I, I can't wait to turn my phone on this morning and see what's going on, whatever, you know? So, um, those are the biggest things or, you know, making sure that I treat, uh, my employees, right. That I have underneath me. That's, that's, that's a big deal for me personally. And I really struggle with it sometimes because while you want them to do the right things and you want them to do things the way that you teach them to do them, you also, I always have this thing in my head where I'm a very independent minded person. And I'm like, well, did I, did I, did I say something that came off the way that maybe it shouldn't have, you know what I mean? And, those little things will stick in your crawl and those little things will also affect the quality of your spirit because they're taking brain power away from what you're doing at the time. And, and maybe those are things that I should find a way to, to cope with and get past, but they are things that certainly affect me as a distiller. So. Adam, how about you? I'm just yeah. wondering what state I'm in. <laughs> yeah. You know, waking up and like, where am I? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. A lot of travel. I'm in my apartment in Brooklyn away in my house in Kentucky I'm on the road you know my kids are all grown right so what else, what else would I be doing right and um that part I actually love um but it can be a challenge trying to keep up with the schedule and trying to manage corn in three states and manage distillations in two states I have an amazing amazing team of people and they have my res total respect and admiration and dedication because I um everybody wears lots of hats we do all of our marketing and um label design and everything in house. And we, uh, you know, I direct our operations, Jillian, she is amazing about, I mean, I've got barrels stored in, you know, four different places in Kentucky and Indiana and Tennessee and, and, um, and we have to bring those in for the blends and she's just amazing at what she does. Right. And then I've got two distillers that are coming up that are remarkable and both willing to learn, uh, both willing you know, to try, you know, every day trying to nail it, right? And um, um, I get overnighted a lot of samples. It's like, did we make the cuts right here? Um, you know, so the logistics of pulling off what we're pulling off right now. And uh, as I pointed out, Jonathan, that's listening to, that's here tonight, um, you know, I'm meeting with him in the morning. We're meeting with the architects for the new project. Um, so I've got lots of, you know, lots of stuff and I wouldn't have it any other way, really. You know, I, uh, the bottom line is I get to the end of the day and I'm grateful for the work. I'm grateful for the farmers. I'm grateful for the truck drivers. I'm grateful for my staff. You know, it's pretty, um, my mentor is Dave Sherrick. Um, Dave's the gentleman that put Woodford Reserve back together. And, you know, um, you know, when things get heavy, <laughs> I'll call him, you know, he's heard me cry more than once. Right. And, um, but, you know, ultimately, you know, we'll go full circle and I, I can't imagine doing anything else. I mean, I just, you know, it's, um, it's every day is a challenge and I actually, you know, kind of embrace those challenges every day. Anyone else just want to weigh in on that one? Yeah, biggest one for us lately, I feel like, has been uh, balancing sales and production. Uh, that, that, that's always a constant challenge, especially when you're talking about laying a product down for multiple years. Uh, you know, prior to COVID, we were, we had the distillery running at uh, the the legal capacity that an Illinois craft, can, craft distillery can be. Uh, you know, stacked up a bunch of bourbon, fantastic, but uh, it, it started to wear the staff pretty thin, quite honestly. You know, we have a production team of three people that we were running that kind of volume with. And quickly we realize like oh shit like the people are what make the distillery function so uh we decided to to pull back production prior to the shelter in place and all that stuff um and balancing that and you know also balancing that with the vision of what what do we want the distillery to look like in the future because obviously if we don't have the inventory laid down to to match this vision it it, it can't become that vision so 
that, that's always a constant battle, but, uh, you know, quite honestly, the, the whole COVID-19 thing has uh, made us realize even more so the importance of our team and our staff, uh, much more so than, um, you know, the, the rest of the distillery as a whole. All right. Lenny, haven't heard from you on challenges. Anything you want to add on top yeah. of what you are doing? Yeah, this is a challenge or two. Um, <laughs> you know, for, I think for us, uh, or for me anyway, I, I mean, like, we're, when it comes to experimentation and just like coloring outside the lines at Deer Hammer, we're habitual line steppers. And where that gets challenging is that, you know, like we, we might, um, you know, become acquainted with a new maltster in the state or, or a new farm that's growing something. And we immediately want to jump on board, but we, we know the, the quality that we've been working with. So to get on board with someone else, it's, it's tricky because it's going to be, it, for us anyway, like as far as I can tell, I can taste new make spirit all day, but I want to see where it goes in two years. Well, that's a long duration of time to experiment and then decide like, huh, let's change course again. And I, I, I kind of chunk that rationale in thinking how many like changes of course do I have in my career? Like, right. I, mean, I don't know, every two years, every five years, you know, so in a sense, like you have to kind of stay the course in some ways because you could have huge variation. I think that's really tricky for us. Um, and then another component of that with uh, wanting to really push the boundaries and do things different is our bandwidth as a small distillery. I mean, we're very small. We're very batch oriented. We only fill 200 barrels a year and we're, you know, we have to allocate certain things to those knowing that in three plus years, you know, we have to sell a certain amount or, or what's the demand going to be. So when I want to do something completely off the wall, that's cool. But then, you know, I have to get reined in to realize that that can't be a viable launch and it's not, <laughs> it's just, there, there's no room for it. So uh, that's kind of tricky. And then another thing that I, I'm sure Deer Hammer isn't unique in this, but I find kind of frustrating. It's definitely challenging is that we're uh, about two hours drive from Denver. We're a super small population and we have no, we have very few skilled uh, folks <clears throat> in our valley. So if our steam boiler goes down and Lisa, did you say you went to boiler school? I did go to boiler school. Like, that's <laughs> she awesome. can help you. She'll come yeah. in and fix it for you. I need to fly you out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's brutal. If something happens, like, who can fix this? I don't know. I highly you recommend can... boiler school. <laughs> I went to boiler school with the boiler inspector there in front of me. A few times. Yeah, I went, I went, we did boiler school through Copper and Kings, and, and the biggest thing I came out with is if the uh, the red light of doom is on, call somebody above your pay grade. Absolutely. <laughs> like our, our, uh, our chiller went out the other day, and like it just things happen, and it's so hard to get people to show up because, man, we live in a really chill place, and people want to be outside hiking and getting on the river. So that that's the weird weirdo challenge. I don't know if you guys deal with, but – you know, just, just being able to keep things up around because everything breaks. Pumps break, God damn it, all the time. And, you know, we're good at fixing stuff, but it's really tough when you can't find folks to help. So, you know, that, that, that's uh, ups and downs of trying to run a distillery in, you know, a beautiful mountain town that has no one to help. All right. Lenny, you'll, you'll like this, buddy. Uh, so one of the reasons my dad got a job at Spirits of French Lick the biggest reason. So first of all, yeah. I could, I could, I could pitch the owners on, he knows how to distill. Right. But the second part was he's very mechanically inclined and you've seen my dumb ass. <laughs> <laughs> they were, they were all about it. You know, they're like, all right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'd be like, yeah, I forgot into that. I can't fix anything. So nice. it eliminates me immediately. Yeah. All right, now it's on to the speed round. Yeah. So with this, we'll actually call on our distillers. Christy and I will ask a question. We'll call on our distillers. And it is all about speed, getting us out, just out the answer to the question. If we're asking for a name, name. That's what we want. So here we go. Here we go. Question number one. You guys are in various stages of owning your distilleries, working for your distilleries, et cetera. But let's look 10 years down the road. So this, this eliminates a lot of things about, well, we need time. We need to experiment all those things. 10 years down the road, what do you, how do, what do you envision your flagship product to be? And that could be type of whiskey. It could be the proof. It could be whatever you want to throw in. What do you envision, you know, your, your flagship? And it could be something you already have. You can be like, well, we got it. We, we're going to continue to roll what we got. But you just answer that question for us. And we're going to start on this one with Lenny. Lenny, what would be 
your flagship brand looking in the, the crystal ball 10 years down the road? Uh, Lenny is not here. Is that mute? mute. <laughs> he's talking. <laughs> Lenny's talking, but he's on mute. Okay, so so Adam, we're, I'm going to throw that to you. Uh, speed round already got screwed up. Someone someone hit mute. My internet took a bigger. Yeah, one of the challenges of having a distillery in a part time. Sorry, uh, I heard flagship, and that, but I didn't hear anything else. So if I heard that word, can yeah, we're looking for ten years down the road. What would your flagship brand look like? It could be something you've got today already. It could be something that is aged longer. It could be a d totally different grain. Tell us kind of what your flagship brand would look like 10 years down the road, your flagship offering. And I think we're going to toss this to Adam because Lenny's, Lenny's clearly okay. having problems. So let's, let's Adam, we're, we're going to put so, Lenny. Uh, Lenny? Lenny? Cool. Okay. So this, this is mine. It's a, so this is a 1953 bottle of Old Monroe. Uh, that is Old Monroe, as you guys know, was our flagship brand or whatever. Um, but Old Monroe was originally distilled in uh, on Columbia's Main Street, my, our hometown, uh, from about 1943 through 1964. And distilling that brand, age stated five years on the original Rickhouse Foundation, distilled out of the original distilling building on Columbia's Main Street, is the goal. That's the goal. Okay. All right, Royce. Uh, flagship brand, <clears throat> it'll be our uh, six to eight year old uh, weeded bourbon or that age, that barrel aged moonshine that we have. Okay. Lenny, can you weigh in now? I hope so. I'm going to try. Um, so our flagship brand, it's going to be the Deer Hammer American Single Malt. It's what we started with. It's our cornerstone. Uh, it's made with 100% malt barley, 80% pale two-row malt, and then even split of chocolate malt, crystal 45 and special bee malt, um, we sour mash. We use a, we've used anywhere from a traditional bourbon yeast to a traditional malt yeast from Scotland. Um, and you know, we're, we're stepping up our age constantly. So now it's minimum two years at that point. I mean, it sure as shit isn't gonna be over five years cause it's all gonna evaporate. So I'm gonna say a five year Deer Hammer American single malt. Okay, Lisa, how about you? Uh, it'll be the Baby Jane corn. Um, it'll be the Baby Jane barrels anywhere from four to 10 years old. We're monitoring them to see how they're developing. And um, ultimately, that intent of that is to replace the uh, source whiskey down the road. So. Okay. Alan, and you finally here on this one. Yeah, for, uh, for Spirits of French Lick, that's going to be the uh, Lee W. Sinclair four grain bourbon. You got to do the four for the four horsemen. Uh, and for me, it's going to be the education that I'm going to be providing when I own my own thing one of these days. So, Okay. Christy, same type of format. Uh, ask your question and then pick them out and have them answered, okay? Okay. So a couple of you already mentioned a couple notable names here. Who do you look up to in the industry? And I'm going to send it out to Lisa first because I want to see if she changes her answer. I'm not going to change my answer. I got stinking lucky. When I moved into distilling, I met, met Dave Sharp. Oh, gosh, I've been distilling now for 10 years, um, eight or nine years ago. Um, and I got lucky he saw something in me. And he is, he rides me hard. He's, he's like, he's, he, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, there's days that it's like, he's, so he flies up to New York to check, check it because he had another he's got another project too so he anyway he's checking out his project and he comes to the distillery and I was so proud of how much I'd accomplished in a really short amount of time and he's like well this is nice but what are you going to do about that what are you going to do about that <laughs> and can we just hang on to this for a minute but um no he you know the the guy um he's he's a name that isn't known as well as he should be he's a lifetime whiskey advocate lifetime achievement award winner um, he was with Seagram's for years. He, the guy knows everybody and everything, right? Um, he wrote the operations manual for Jack Daniels. He wrote the operations manual for early times. He wrote the early, operations manual for half a dozen different distilleries and including Woodford Reserve. And uh, right now I actually have here in, in my living room uh, a notebook where it, on his own time he had sketched out what um, his intent was with those iconic pot stills before he'd gone to Scotland, um, how this was the first pot stills back in the United States after, after prohibition. And um, he is amazing. He's incredibly generous with what he knows. And um, now we collect, the interesting now is I work with him and um, um, 
and you know it's the greatest compliment of all is he'll call me or leave something on my front stoop since I've been sick he's you know left a couple things in my basket out front but he wants my wants my feedback on it you know and um so our relationship just shifted and changed to more peers than to mentor and men, you know mentoree is that a word um yeah. So anyway, okay. I'll eternally, be eternally grateful. And he's 75 years old. He's still out working, right? He's got his new brand boondocks and he's still a consultant on several different projects, but now he gets to pick and choose. He looks at his wife and says, you know, where do you want to go? And then he'll take those jobs, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Royce, how about you? Uh, <clears throat> definitely Alan Bishop. So uh, he's my brother in alchemy. Uh, I've had more meaningful conversations with Alan than I ever have with anybody else. Uh, when it comes to distilling. So him and I talk all the time, besides from distillers talk. Uh, he's been there for me for the last two or three years. So since I met him, so uh, it's, it's definitely Alan. So appreciate everything you've done for me, Alan. No problem, mm -hmm. man. That's right. <laughs> uh, that's a hard question to answer. <laughs> um, you know, Love your voice. Yeah. There's a lot of modern day uh, folks that not to be given to, but for me, I feel like uh, my time, you know, in this world has been almost a lifetime in itself. And I look at, you know, like who I grew up with in a sense and whether they were ahead of me or doing things at the same time. Uh, there were so many folks that either are still in the industry or aren't, but, you know, uh, so many in Colorado, like um, the crew from Peach Street Distillery, the original crew were super inspiring and gave us a push when we needed it. Stranahan's back in the day, original inspiration, their first distiller, Jake Norris, that dude's the man, like just massive information there. Um, the guys from Downslope Distillery, super underrated, and you know, start playing the music. So many, uh, start turning down his lights and start playing the music like they do at the Oscars. <laughs> I'd like to thank my mother. I'd like to thank my father. Yeah, there's a lot really like uh <laughs> that's true, you're right. I did sound like that. Um <laughs> I don't know, man. I guess like, and I also, I think like everyone, like I always want to be inspired. I want to be inspired every day. I'm, I'm inspired by walking out my house and looking at these like gigantic mountains that I get to live around. But I love that we have such creative industry that I'm always like getting nudged by people who are pushing the boundaries and making me want to make better shit. So everyone, that's a cop out answer, but it's true. Okay. Okay. Adam, how about you? Uh, if I had to pick one person, it'd be a guy by the name of Herman Lorenz. Uh, it's a, that's the guy that uh, had the, uh, pardon my language, but had the balls to reopen a uh, distillery in Columbia, Illinois in 1940, uh, when the only thing that was sitting on the property that he did was a defunct brewery that was still stale from Prohibition. So uh, I was fortunate enough to get my hands on some of his ledgers and notes and uh, just to to see the man's thoughts, you know, in a time that was a uh, really interesting in our country's history was just absolutely unbelievable and kind of opened my eyes and gave me a ton, ton, ton of respect for him. And Alan. All right. As always, my answer is multifaceted. So <clears throat> uh, it is what it is. It's not one person. I, there's four people and sorry, it just is what it is. I make my own rules. So, uh, first and foremost, as Royce said, here it comes. It is what it is. So, uh, first and foremost, you couldn't ask for a better brother than Royce Neely. Uh, Royce is exactly where I wish I was 10 years ago, truthfully. So he's on the right track and he's doing big things. Uh, second, my father and third, my daughter. Uh, and then fourth, my, uh, my whole thing is a lot like a Hank Williams Jr. song. So all of my heroes are fucking dead. Uh, William Dalton, who was the master distiller for the Daisy Spring Distillery for 55 years, running two pot stills off of wood fires. Uh, and you can't imagine the way that this old man was beat down by the time he died. You know, I look up to him more than anybody else because he was the longest tenured Hoosier distiller in history. Um, you know, and to be able to leave a mark like that for somebody to find it years later is a big deal. Yeah. Great. Yeah. All right. That, that was good. You stuck foreign, but I think they were pretty, pretty solid there. So they were, they yeah. were good. You, you did good. You did good. Uh, another one, just again, speed round, kind of what you're looking to do if that you're not doing now, this could be a different style of whiskey. It could be a different grain. Just what's, what's one thing that you would like to be doing that you're not currently doing at your distillery. Rice. Absinthe. 
absent. Okay. Alan Bishop. Come back to me. <laughs> Adam Stumpf. Come back to me too. Lisa. Malt whiskey. I love making malt and I have, keep putting it on the schedule and we keep getting squeezed out. <laughs> okay, that's cool. When we have the new distillery, we'll be making some malt. All right, Lenny. I think um, big departures from current styles. So be it our single malt, our bourbon, and we're starting to mess with that, but uh, trying to kind of, you know, stick a pole in the ground and where there's just something that's so different. You can taste it too, like, whoa, different product, but almost everything's the same except for one big change. Okay. But I like doing that. Adam? Uh, man, like I love making whiskey just in general. So the, the big thing for me is a different sales channel. And that is more or less blowing out um, a, a program that we've been working on. We've got that keg cocktail uh, patent that we just recently filed. Uh, and amazing. Yeah. Blowing that program out of the water with, absolutely anything that I can get inside of a six barrel keg with anything that comes off of our stills is, is going to be it. I don't care really what the category is, but I want to make some hooch to fill some kegs. All right. Alan, back to you. True Hoosier style peach brandy from Fleener Peaches. Oh, cool. That makes sense. Yeah. You got the apple brandy to add a peach to the mix. I think that'd go over well. All right, Christy, uh, one last question from you. I think you got a good one uh, lined up there. And then we're going to throw it open to questions from the audience here. Okay. So you guys talk to a lot of unknown distillers, craft distillers, people that we don't know about yet. If you had to throw out one name that needs to be on our radar, who would it be? I'm going to show it over to Royce first. All right, two of them. So my cousin, Bill Hall, who's 86. Hey, his uh, banana brandy, unbelievable. The next one's George Rose. So George is a great distiller here from uh, Northern Kentucky. Um, he does a great job. And uh, Akeley, you've tried his stuff. Sure, I love great. his stuff, yeah. Uh, we, yeah. We're going to have him on distillers talk soon. But George likes to push the balance on the illegal side. So I would definitely keep an eye out or an ear out for George in the future. I want to try that banana brandy. It's good. Lenny. Lenny. Um, nope. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. I'm just going to keep talking. Okay. Um, we got a lot of good things happening out here in Colorado. Um, one of the newer distilleries that I think a lot of folks are stoked about based on what they've been doing and how cool they are, uh, that would be Talnua Distillery. They're in uh, just outside of Denver. And it would be Patrick Miller, Megan Miller, and the rest of their crew. And they're doing uh, an Irish-style pot still whiskey in America. So uh, they definitely have some legal struggles with Ireland pushing back on what you can call it, but their whiskey is phenomenal. A traditional Irish style where it's half malted barley, half unmalted barley, triple pot distilled. Uh, Patrick was a former distiller at Strandhands. What they're turning out is fucking awesome. So keep an eye. Okay. Uh, Lisa. Oh gosh. Um, being in New York, it's been interesting. Uh, New York's the second largest distilling state in the United States, 180 distilleries in New York, right? Old distilling tradition, actually some old family stories, um, some pretty remarkable stuff. Um, one of the things I love about them is we like spend time in the Catskills at camps and stuff, you know? Um, but anyway, Kevin Ford, I've gotten to know Kevin Ford from Buffalo Distilling and um, he gets it. You know, um, the dedications there, the stuff you can't teach, right? The enthusiasm, the dedication, the love of it, um, crazy hours, you know, but his products are phenomenal. He's really doing some really nice stuff. So and they've just expanded their distillery in Buffalo as well. Nice. Alan. I'm going to cheat again. I'm going to give two. So the first is Polo Hamong Rice Whiskey. He kind of comes and goes, um, but he makes some of the best white whiskey you'll ever taste in your life. Um, from a very different grain base. And the second is the person who has not yet gotten into distilling who listens to the show 20 years from now. There you go. I got one for you too. <clears throat> I tell you, everybody's already going to keep their eyes on this guy, but it's definitely Freddie No. I think if there's okay. one guy that pushes the bounds from that commercialized standpoint and who's able to do it, it's Freddie No. So I'm excited to see. I think he does a lot of very Jerry Dalton esque things down the road. Yes. It's be interesting to see what he does. Yeah, he actually no, looks cool. <laughs> yeah, I think we see uh, Freddie No drop in a uh, three chamber down the road. Yeah, yeah no, it's going to be cool. He's doing some phenomenal stuff. Yeah. 
Yes, he does. Yeah. He's learning like the rest of us, but uh, it's going to be cool. Yeah, you know, I first got to know him um, when I was making wine in Kentucky, and he called, we met, and he called me. He's like, you know what? Booker used to make um, wine in the basement. My dad never bothered to learn. And so he started making wine Surprise. in the basement, right? And so he called me to try to figure out where to, where to get bottles, and he called me that's to try so to cool. Yeah, God, yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. You can just listen to that stuff all day long. That's the kind of stuff you love to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Freddie doing, you know, trying to recreate stuff his grandfather was doing. That's... Yeah, he's been friends ever since. Yeah. Yeah. That's why Adam... he's going to be one to keep his eye on. Yeah. I, your completely, eye on. I completely agree. Yeah. Adam, do you have a name for us? Yeah. Uh, I'm, most of you guys on here, or a lot of you guys on here, know this name. Uh, not new to the industry, but uh, Thomas Earl McKenzie. Oh, but yeah. Yeah, I love Thomas. He's got a, he's got, he's, yeah. he's got his hands in so many projects. He's got a couple cool ones he's working on now. But, uh, really, really cool approach to um, to distillation and uh, that enthusiasm and love for the approach of distillation can uh, no doubt turn out a unique and quality whiskey. So definitely want to keep an eye on I agree with that one 100%, Adam. And by the way, uh, if you're not following Thomas McKenzie on Facebook or social media, you should, because McKenzie is like a Bob Dylan song. Whichever way the wind blows him that day, that's where he's at. And that's awesome. He's just chasing his dream. He's doing his thing. <laughs> yes, he is. Very cool. Well, what I'd like to do next, again, open it up for questions here. Jonathan, I'm going to take you off a of mute here right now. And uh, so, Jonathan, uh, you had asked me a question you sent over to me in chat, but why not go ahead and ask it yourself? Sure. So, I mean, knowing that one of the cardinal rules of distilling is cleanliness, do you guys have any concerns or special methods from switching from the industrial alcohol back to the consumable alcohol? Are you concerned about the industrial alcohol impregnating the distillation system anywhere? Yes. The answer is yes. Yeah. That shit stinks. I mean, yes, it's terrible. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Rebecca, how long did you clean that uh, uh, gun we used to fill the barrels yesterday? I don't know if she can. Uh, too fucking long. How about that? <laughs> too fucking long. There it is. So, and, and I still smell that's a, that's an industry it. My nose afterwards, right I'm like, it's still in there, Becca. She almost fucking hit me with it. So. <laughs> All right. uh, yes, for sure. There's always uh, there's always going to be a fight between cross contamination, and it's not. I think for a lot of us to do a lot of diverse products, it's not anything new. You know, we it's the same difference between switching between industrial alcohol and absinthe, except absinthe might be worse because while it's okay to have a little bit of a licorice note in a very good bourbon, you don't want licorice to be the primary flavor of your bourbon. So. Right. We fight with that a lot at Spirits of French Lick. Um, we might fight with it sometimes two or three days in a row uh, before we actually feel comfortable switching products. Yeah. I mean, Becca can tell you this too. I, I bitch all the time about like how, <clears throat> although we're hand sanitizing, it's very dirty in the distillery trash and people walking around and just, just people in there and, and helping and things. And like, I don't even, when we're in normal production, I don't even allow a uh, garbage can inside the distillery because we sweet mash. So I'm just hyper concerned about cleanliness all the time in there. So it's uh, been an interesting experiment thus far. Yeah. Yeah. We never, we never really pivoted to hand sanitizer. Um, I mean, I, I think we just didn't have the bandwidth to do it, but I'm going to take your question in way left field and talk about where we do kind of like cross contamination. Um, We'll do brandy every once in a while. You know, like we'll get hit up by a winery who wants uh, distillate so they can make a fortified wine. We did something recently where we used the brandy back set as our sour mashing agent in our bourbon. Nice. I, don't know if that, I don't think that, I don't know if it disqualifies it as being a bourbon or not. I don't care really. I'll figure that out later. But I like some level of cross-contamination where you get to like inform one project with another so no hand sanitizer uh informing going on but you know where it makes sense all right uh who else has questions again five great distillers here you got to really see some insight into them today and what they're doing and any questions you have it could be about their business it could be about distilling in general it could be about the people they know Lisa sounds like she has a pretty cool place she lives at. I don't know. Cool neighbors, right? You gotta come see me. It's yes. really cool. you know, you go you go up to that corner of Red Hook. It's not any different than being in Kentucky. I mean, there's cobblestone streets, you know, and 
we get barrel deliveries and we roll them across the cobblestones and into the warehouse, you know, but you get walk, the, walk across the threshold in the distillery and, you know, it, it, it doesn't really matter where you are, really. It's a beautiful corner of the world. I've been fortunate to distill in some really beautiful places. Cool. I, got a, I got a question for everybody, for all the distillers here. So, and I don't have a good answer for it because I got a million answers for it, but uh, uh, what, what inspires you guys that's not in the distilling world? Right, could be music, could be movies, whatever. What uh, what what gives you a little bit of inspiration? Like the rest of us, the non-distillers? No, no, all the distillers. Oh, the distillers. Oh, okay. I Sorry, thought I non-distillers, so I wasn't listening. Yeah. Close enough. <laughs> Say that again, Alan. <laughs> so, what what inspires you guys? Like, uh, well, let's just go with music. All right, so let's say. Uh, Pick a song or a band. What inspires you guys? You know, outside of distilling, something outside of distilling that inspires your distilling. Old guitarist. I've been chasing when I'm traveling. I've been chasing old guitarists because you can always find that single seat that nobody wants for like a discount price at the last minute. And so, you know, the last couple of years, I've been able to see Jeff Beck a couple of times. I've seen Buddy Guy. I've seen Clapton. I've seen Frampton. I've seen. And so the old guitarists are keeping me coming because, you know, as everybody like my age is starting to like go away and die and all that sort of stuff. So anyway, I'm trying to see all these guys at least one more time, you know, but um, um, yeah, you know, that's I awesome. love every, all, everything, but the, that's, that's my guilty pleasure is chasing down old guitarists. But Madison Square Gardens, Virginia Beach, you know, uh, Atlanta. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Well, real quick for shits and giggles for everybody else answers, answers, Lisa, who's your favorite? What's your favorite guitar player? Oh my God, that's not fair. It's like me asking my favorite bourbon. I'm going to clap out. <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> Depends on what week it is, right? I'm going with David Gilmore. <laughs> that counts. <laughs> the inspiration is uh, history and really seeing how the, technological. The question is music. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. It, it doesn't have to be. Be whatever inspires you, but okay, yeah. Fair okay, enough. I'm sorry. Yeah. I thought Alan specifically. No, no, you're good. Uh, so, and how uh, history and how techn te technological advances in a specific period impact uh, the distilling industry, and just seeing how production processes change um, and everything along that line. So, uh, in, in looking forward, I tend to look back quite a bit. Yeah, I, you know, I I, um, I like things that I, I like when things stop me in my tracks, and uh, my, I think my kid's about to stop me in my tracks. He just rolled in here, but uh, where, where I'm going with that, I guess, um, be it like uh, like art, music, something on the visual side. You know, like I guess, like to riff on that, like art uh, is often a hard to qualify thing. Like people often say, "What is art?" And for me, that is something that does stop me in my face. It does cause deep contemplation and like I, something that I can't avert my gaze from. And then that could also be scenery. It could also be just flow in anything in life. But um, I, I like to look for that in all things and try my best to apply it to my own craft because if whiskey can become that thing, be it a bourbon or rye, whatever, uh, any spirit and any, any any experience like that that's the goal to like stop someone in their tracks and have them be like whoa like i have to think about this um so i'm always looking for those things and mm -hmm. that, yeah i guess it's me right yeah right common sense so the old man's instilled that in me from a young age i mean it's I never try to, uh, and I, Beck will tell you, I, I overanalyze a lot of things way too much, but, uh, you know, I always try to revert back to just trying to use common sense for, for a lot of things. So distilling, it applies a lot in distilling all the time, and it applies a lot just in, you know, normal day-to-day -day life. So I try to think that um, I'm lucky that the good Lord blessed me with a fair amount of common sense. All right. Alan, we got to ask you, too, the same question, man, since you were throwing it out there. Yeah it's it's always music there's uh that's that's always my thing that's what i always go back to music or, or sometimes even you know the more esoteric leanings in life but if i had to boil it down to one thing there's one single song uh and it, it probably has more to do with you know dividing your life between industry and family whatever but there's a, a peter murphy song that's called uh cut you up which is uh which kind of 
basically defines my existence at this point. So, okay. and uh, before Alan or Alan, before Stump let me like pop out with that and go with something else outside of music, it was going to be Simple Man, Leonard Skinner. It's kind of like the song I go back to a lot of times. So nice, it's mainstream, okay. but I like it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anybody else have a question for our distillers? It can be for all of them. It can be one of them. Whatever you'd like to ask. Rare I'd like to know if, uh, if anybody is using any textured barrels, like the grooved groove staves or the honeycombs. Yep. Yeah, we uh, <laughs> we we do that at Spirits of French Lick. We do. Uh, we switched to Zach Cooperage about two years ago, and we are doing the groove stave technology. Uh, so with the number two char, what that basically gives us in the body of the uh, of the barrel is we get a medium plus uh, toast on the inside of the grooves and a number two char on the outside of the grooves. So we get kind of the best of both, wor both worlds uh, because the char itself basically works as a filtration agent, uh, whereas the medium plus toast actually gives us the flavor and the sugars that we're after. Same thing, Brian. Every uh, barrel we have on site has been grooved. Adam, I know you do those too. Yeah, we run a, we don't run all grooved, but we do run a grooved and then the independent stave, uh, wave stave version of that barrel as well. Okay. Nice. We've done um, honeycomb staves in the past. It was a long time ago. And uh, what's kind of fun is, you know, it's been almost 10 years and we still have about four of them kicking around in our rack house that, just we keep refilling with other things but all in all we've decided on uh well i'd love to experiment more we just have a standard profile now from independent stave where it's 53 gallon um God, what do they call it cooper select cooper reserve i can't remember uh heavy toast number two char and we just kind of run with that and shape everything else to fit that profile yeah, yeah. didn't he accidentally got uh um uh, uh, barrel from one of his competitors a big big bourbon and uh, he's, he's aging something in that we won't say what it is we won't say what it is on the air yeah. come visit and check it out that's andrew <laughs> Weebring. andrew's a big fan of number two char medium plus or heavy toast he is maybe one of the smartest guys in the industry when you're talking about barrels and wood and all that we break that guy he's a, he's a genius now everything else in life he's an idiot but in that part of his life <laughs> He's a genius. So yeah, I love hanging out with Weebrick. He's a great dude. So just, I love giving him a hard time too. He's an awesome guy. Absolutely. Other questions for our distillers? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so the Robinsons. Uh, okay, this is this is for uh, Adam and Royce. Oh, Robinsons will be next. Um, you both talked about uh, growing bloody red butcher corn. How are you going to incorporate this into a mash bill? Yeah, so we've uh, so I went down and met <clears throat> actually met Stump in person last year with Steve Akeley, and uh, I got to talk with him a little bit, and he was showing me all the varieties he's growing and everything. And uh, I was like, you know, we want to start doing some of that on our farm as well. So Adam, being the great guy that he is, uh, you know, told us he'd hook us up with the seeds to start with. Uh, but we're going to incorporate the Bloody Butcher into a rye whiskey, actually. Okay. So it's going to be roughly about uh, twenty-two percent of a mash bill that we use on a rye whiskey. That will lend itself really well to that mash bill. Like that. Thank you, Adam. Uh, we we we've moved. Uh, we we played around a, a boatload with recipes as high as eighty five percent corn in bourbon, uh, down to fifty one percent with the Bloody Butcher. And where we settled was a, a recipe out of a manuscript we found from nineteen eleven. And uh, this specific recipe is kind of referenced again in a a guy that just plagiarized the hell out of it in 1937. But anyway, uh, the recipe is 60% Indian corn. Uh, so we put the bloody butcher in there, 25% rye and 15% malted barley. And it is killer. Uh, the oldest we have is about a year old right now, but probably one of my favorite recipes in the Rick house. Okay. The, the reason I ask this is because, you know, Woodhead has a hundred percent bloody red butcher corn, he call you know Gary calls it a corn whiskey, mm -hmm. um, even though it, by definition, it'd be called it could be called a bourbon. Um, I was just curious how you guys were going to incorporate this into mash bills, but uh, thank you. Yeah, no, it, it, it's definitely good enough to stand on its own, like Gary's done it. But uh, yeah, it's, we've we've tended to lean on that that sixty percent number. Yeah, and I think I think you know if you put that into other stuff, it could actually make you know, something totally different and better. 
dude, Stump, that's almost the uh, that's almost the exact reverse of, uh, and Lisa can probably comment on this. That's almost the exact reverse of the uh, Virginia style rye mash bill. That's pretty cool. That's that's kind of interesting that somebody uh, somebody was basically pulling the exact opposite at that time. So if you if you've got any historical literature on that, man, I'd I'd love to see some of it. I do. I've got a. I think I've got it saved down. Uh, I will shoot it over your way for sure. Yeah, if you want to awesome. share, it, I'd love to see it too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ah, there you go. Cool. And All Rick, right. I know you like to cook. Um, I'm just going to say, um, spent grain, spent bloody butcher would be really good in a corn muffin. This is bloody butcher cornmeal. Oh, nice. And kept it great. Bread. The first thing I do. The first thing I do when I start considering one of the heirloom grains. Of course, I inherited the the um, baby Jane, but we also run bloody butcher and we run Wapsie Valley because those are the parents of baby Jane, and so we make those expressions too, so people can understand the difference between all of that, but I always bake it into cornbread first. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. been a few varieties that are too herbaceous, they're too this or they're too that, you know, but you bake some cornbread, low sugar, no sugar cornbread, and you know exactly, not exactly, but you know what. I agree. That's yeah. a good point. Yeah. We, we were on a wood we hat. Uh, they were doing that, right, uh, Justine? Justine and I went out there and Gary made some cornbread for us, so just to show us that same thing. Me and Kim do grits. Because you're basically making grits yeah. when you make whiskey. So yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, I know the Robinsons had a question. What did you guys want to ask our distillers? What would you like to do at your distillery? What was the first part of that? I'm sorry. If money was no object, okay. what would you like to do at your distillery? So money's no object. What would you like to do at your distillery? Education. Period. End of story. Education for the public, education for who? For yourself? Anybody who's any, no, all of the above. You, mm -hmm. you no, know, you learn as much from so the public employees? as you do from teaching the public. Uh, employees, the public, myself, et cetera. You know, if I could get people in there to talk and, and do their thing and teach uh, myself, my employees, and the public, that's what I would love to do. Okay. Other thing, other distillers. Money's no object. What uh, would what you like to do at your distillery? Ours would probably be converting our current column to a 24 inch square copper column. Hmm. Hmm. That's cool. That would be cool. I'm yeah. going to come see that. <laughs> <laughs> that money that's, that, that's like coffee. coffee. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was a half at, like, I was halfway expecting you to say stump like a wood square wood <laughs> coffee still because you know but anyways the the, stump, even, the copper one is even cooler really but you get it done and i'm going to divide my time between the uh the garden shed back behind iron root republic and the garden shed back behind your distillery <laughs> <laughs> if money is no you option for us, across the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> if money is uh is no option for us i uh i'd just love to have three vendome like all copper pots in there so, and I would love to have a Vendome three chamber like uh, Todd Leopold's got over at Leopold Brothers. Yes. I love whiskeys, and I just think that allows you to make the most versatile whiskeys in the world with those. So, yeah, I, I would do some uh, pretty weird stuff, I think, by most standards. Like, you know, we're at 8,000 feet and we're just down the road, or just up, yeah, just down the road from, uh, you know, Mount Princeton is the closest 14 or to us. So, at 14,200 feet, I would love to put a rack house up there. I mean, I don't, I don't think we're getting approval to put it on the summit, but if we could age, mature our whiskey at the highest elevations and then get to go in the complete opposite direction, we get the question all the time, uh, you know, what does elevation do for your whiskey? We, we don't get the chance to know for sure because we only make it where we make it. I would love to have a second distillery, mirror the distillery at sea level. Uh, you know, probably somewhere awesome at sea level, like I don't know, Hawaii or somewhere. Like, yeah, there you go. Costa Rica. <laughs> That'd be cheap. Yeah. Hey, one other thing. That's I'd definitely like a money no object deal. Yeah. yeah. And this this is really going to throw it out there. But Alan, I would love to see a three chamber design that could be run under vacuum. Oh yeah. Oh, dude. Yeah. Not just yeah. a pot still, because a pot still would be sweet as well. But I'd like to see an all copper three chamber that is designed to where you can run it under vacuum, so you can yeah. distill it at lower temperatures. And and this is where you win the prize for asking the best question because I'm going to be up the rest of the night going, how the hell would that work, Royce? <laughs> it's 9:45, <laughs> right? I've been thinking right. about it, Alan. This is right. 
awkward because Jonathan's here from Luckett and Farley, who's overseeing our new project, right, in Brooklyn. And so he knows what I want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we're meeting our architects or pod architects that did Rabbit Hole. Um, and so, yeah, Jonathan knows what I want. <laughs> yep. And, 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 actually, and actually, bef actually, before I came to Luckett and Farley, actually, my career was in vacuum distillation. So... We nice. might need to partner up. We might, we might need to just all get together and do some brainstorming. Yeah. Right. Jonathan's the best, you guys. If you, like you said, doing I started anything. messing with it, Jonathan. We processed CBD oil at the distillery. So I yeah. started messing around with uh, processing CBD oil under vacuum to where I could still use my stills, but uh, keep the cannabinoids and uh, the terpenes and stuff from being burned off. So, and then mm -hmm. I started thinking, like, a pot still would be sweet to do under vacuum, but what about a three chamber as you alter those levels? What if you could do different vacuums on each level? On each level, yeah. yeah. Jonathan, if you want the uh, the Willy Wonka of distillation equipment, you just get with the uh, the distillers on this show. Lisa obviously knows what she wants, and where <laughs> she would let where she would let us play, we could we could obviously lead you down some more rabbit holes. So, okay, there we go. Because I was so, taking staff, but maybe all of you, I would love to take my staff on a world. If I had money, was no object, I'd take them on a world whiskey tour. I've had so many invitations everywhere from you know different places in Asia and obviously in Europe and in Africa and things and I would take my whole staff and we would go we would just go <laughs> and uh, Stump really hit the nail on the head earlier with Thomas Earl McKenzie yes. so yes. where I see Alan pushing a lot of the distilling bounds a lot of times it's Thomas that pushes it on that engineering and steel side that I've yes. seen a lot like I mean the guy's designing right now a three chamber that he could sell to the you know the public so It'd be I cool to start, see I what he, he Thomas's juice right over yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it'd be cool to see Thomas is probably already distilled under vacuum with a uh, three chamber Allen. Yeah. So. yeah, yeah. Thomas Earl McKenzie should be. Uh, there shouldn't. Be, he should not be a member of the Bourbon Hall of Fame. He should have his own damn category and be the first person in that category. Yeah, <laughs> I had no idea. He made the uh, the still for Stolen Wolf. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know this till the other day. I mean, beautiful still. Me and Steve have seen it in person. Yep. I mean, a beautiful still. Thomas designed <laughs> and, and made that. I had the honor of being He's kind of the Hunter S. Thompson of bourbon. Yeah, yeah definitely. I had the honor of being at Stolen Wolf for their first rosin rye distillation. They had me come to help. I got it. I got a question. Uh, so I've noticed that Rick Brenner has been quiet the whole time, but he's been doing shots the whole time. <laughs> the whole time, Rick Brenner. Oh, so he's Rick, fine. The, this is, yeah, yeah. The legend. Is, you know, the legend this, doesn't slow down. Hey, the legend. This is the distillers turning everything around on somebody in the audience, all right? So I got I to I gotta say Deer this. Hammer. Deer hammer. <laughs> Rick. What we need from you. It's a, it's a new, it's new equation, new uh, accusation. <laughs> we need. He'll be out tomorrow, Lenny. <laughs> we need the thought of the day from Rick Brenner. Just the thought of the, the legend. day. The legend, yes. Thoughts of the day. Well, Just since, I've been un, since I've been un, unemployed for two weeks, um, <laughs> I don't have a whole lot of thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, Rick, uh, you know, Justine, a measure for her is when she can buy a ticket before you do. That that gives that gives her. She's like, I, I, when, I, when I when I launch a new class, she'll be like, "Did I get in before Rick?" And she's she's been doing it recently. You, you've been you've been slow on the draw, so Justine's been winning. So yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> I've been doing I said, things every class. I'm talking all the time, you know. You had a I streak mean, going of like like twenty classes in a row where you were I the got, first I person got, on the I list. Yelled at by my daughter, you know. <laughs> so, and, but I've been, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm on purple, feel, so I've been doing other things. So, don't I feel like phone on the, you know, so I feel like Rick Brenner has the same rules that Alan Bishop does. If he's home and he's not working, he can't do any official business whatsoever until he gets his slippers on. So, it's fair that Justine beat him to everything <laughs> because he's going to put his slippers on first. Hey, but I, hey, for I still, you know, this is the first time today. This is the first time. I've had pants on in 24 hours. So yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Rick. Thank you for that. You know, but since uh, this was my uh, most current acquisition, yeah, he's. I've been enjoying this. Yeah, I like the I like the deer hammer. So yeah. Oh, Lenny, my hands are my hat. My hat is off to you. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Let me. I think it works. That, that, that product works. It's, it's, it no, sounds I, like it's still good. His pants are off to you. I think it's great because we, we talk about, you know, I've been, I've been drinking bourbon for over 45 years, okay? And up until, I don't know, about five years or so ago, I did the bourbon trail. Okay, did all the all the majors. We did everything in the existing bourbon trail in about five days. And after that, I'm like, well, what else is there to do? Well, then there's this craft distillers tour. Okay, so I started doing that on my own. Um, and I started discovering craft distillers, not only in Kentucky, but in St. Louis, mm -hmm. in Missouri. You know, Adam. You know, and a bunch Gary. of others. Yeah. Gary. Yeah. Gary, uh, of course. You know, yeah. It's still 630. And, you know, it's like, and you talk about young whiskeys. And it opened my eyes up to, you know, there's there's things about young whiskeys that they're not bad. They're just young. Right. It's a different. You get the right people making a, it. It can be as good as anything out there you can buy. Profile, yeah. And it's not bad. Okay. Um, when I was younger, it was like, yeah, you always looked at the age on a bottle, you know, whether it was bottle and bond, that was a, that was a, you know, thing, but it's like, no, there's all kinds of, uh, you know, and, and the, the grains that are used and everything else. It's like, um, it's exciting times in whiskey for sure. Oh yeah, well, exactly. You, I like know? Your, uh, you got a preview of our, uh, 28 days away from being bottled in bond. I know that's what I'm drinking right now. <laughs> that's awesome. It's great. It's well, great. Thanks. I'm drinking it too. Yeah. Um, soon as life gets back to normal, we are going to get Lenny in the state of Missouri. So we're working. Well, that's on that. good. That's yeah. you know. That, that that can happen. So yep, yep, that, that will That'll happen. And, uh, I don't know. We'll get Lenny in, and then he's got to come support the market. So he's got to come hang out with us. So I can drive out before it's normal. I like yeah. road trips. I was yeah. I was, I was looking at my looking house. At where, uh, where you live at compared to how close to New Mexico it is. Oh, we're about uh, maybe three hours. Three because hours. Um, as an old Boy Scout, I've been to Philmont like seven times, which is in Cimarron, New Mexico. Yeah. I I think this is crying. Crying. <laughs> that was an hour south of the, you know, Colorado border and I'm like well if I wanted to visit Lenny I could take the train out and I could travel north I wanted to see how how, how south of Denver you guys were <laughs> we, well uh for anyone who wants to come visit Deerhammer and check out we've got apparently we're a little shy of New York I always thought we were leading we've got about 100 distilleries but Deerhammer we're smack in the middle of Colorado so yeah. It's a really good, uh, I don't know if it's the best place to start, but it's a good place to come up. And, you know, you can point in any direction and hit anyone within a few hours. So it's worth checking out. Yeah, but you're south of Denver. We are south of Denver, and uh, we're north of New Mexico. Yeah, so I can take the train out to you know, New Mexico. I can go around the car and drive up there. So, yeah. <laughs> so it goes away. Game on. <laughs> I, I, I've already done it as a Boy Scout, so, you know. You know. <laughs> Rack house. There's a spot right here. Yeah, the stay legend. in the rack house. There you go for the legend. <laughs> the legend can stay in the rack house. All right. Uh, I, 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 will, I will say that was one cool thing about um, ADI in Colorado, in Denver, Colorado, last year was all the distilleries from Colorado. I mean, it's it's amazing how many there are and how many are putting out really good stuff right now. Yeah, I got Thanks. I got one more I got one more question, and I feel like it's a it, it's a very good, very relevant one. So I feel like with everybody that's on this podcast right now on this video, uh, I feel like I have a pretty good understanding of of where everybody stands as far as you know the distillers as well as the listeners. But there's one person who is always very incredibly quiet about their opinions, and I've got to ask this one person this one question because I feel like even amongst the ABV Network crew. I feel like I understand where Steve Akeley stands on things. Kevin Rose stands on things. Christy Atkinson stands on things. I got to ask Justine, because she's been quiet the whole time. Justine, can you tell us five distillers who are clearly attention deprived why you care? What, what interests you and in what we do? 
Oh, geez. Uh, why I care? I am a big supporter of craft distillers. Um, I, I don't want to say underdog, but I always root for the small guy, which are craft distillers. Um, it really, 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 really bothers me when people don't give it a chance. You know, they just, they see craft, they see young, and they're just like, eh, and it pisses me off, really, because they just, they don't try, and so, yeah, I absolutely love what you guys do. Yeah, and, and I, I don't want to answer for Justine, but the thing that she didn't touch on there is, is Justine connects with the people. So, so I, I think it means the world to Justine to go into Adam Stump's place and see him and his wife, Laura there. And the people that when you buy that bottle of whiskey, you're seeing the people exactly that that's going to impact that that's going to make the day. When you go up to Neely family, you're spending your money and, and that, that, you know, exactly where that money is going to go. Uh, so I think, you know, craft and, and connecting with the individuals and knowing the impact that your dollars make. Now, when I go to Big Bourbon and I spend that money, that's going to, maybe it's even going out of the country. It's, it's going, you, you know, you, you don't see exactly what's being impacted by that. Certainly it does, but it's such big volume and, and numbers like that. In reality, that purchase that you're making probably doesn't really make that much of a difference. But when you go ring that register and you make a $150 sale because you're buying a couple of bottles, that, that's an impact that that distiller is going to remember that day, right there, right there. And that's going to make a difference in their family on that particular day. And, and I, I, again, I don't want to answer for Justine, but I, I think that's part of the equation as well. Yeah, and definitely. You love spending time with Justine. Steve? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I'm almost to the point of getting a restraining order. I spend too much time. I, I, yeah, I haven't gone really since the, the whole COVID thing, which has probably been a nice break for you guys. You've probably been enjoying some time away from, from me. But I need to work out. You tell me what day this week I can come over because I want to sample from that barrel. I want to I want to get that rolling on that barrel. So yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so you, you tell me what you're going. I'll drive you. Okay. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go this week. So it depends on what Adam tells me if it's Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. So let me know when. I was going to say that was a great answer from just Steve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Justine is shy. And I, 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 I hate answering for her because I hate adding to that. But I, you know, I, I do want to it, throw it's that It's true. I yeah. mean, I, 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 something I, I probably, I am the type of person where I, even in like an argument or just like a conversation, it's like you answer it. And then like an hour later, it's like, fuck, I should have said that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know what I know what that means to her. The people of yep. craft distilling. I know what that yeah. means to her. So, and just putting it out there, anytime I'm at any of your distilleries, I am more than happy to help. Well, she wants to work there. Yes. Yeah. Yes. She, she's the Adam best knows free labor in I the world. I helped out one day at his distillery. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. She 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 loves that. So you're not putting her out when you're when you're like do this. She loves that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Alan. Yeah. When we came back from New Orleans and hand sanitizer was, you know, really, you know, hard to get, I was running low. And before, you know, thank God Adam and others started making it locally, um, I was almost thinking about, ha I was almost thinking I was going to have to take a couple bottles of your absence and no. make it into hand sanitizer. That'd be criminal. It's high enough proof. That'd be criminal. But Listen, I thought, stop I thought, that crazy talk, Rick. I was, I was, I was ever going to think if I started using hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer to smell like licorice. <laughs> Listen, this this is not a political statement whatsoever, Rick Branner. But what I will say is that our president has said that we can take antiseptics internally to some extent. All right, <laughs> whether you really said it or not. <laughs> At least if you're going to drink an antiseptic, make sure that it is worthwhile to drink and it tastes <laughs> good. Absent. Yes, there you go. <laughs> so I, was, I was thinking, you know, the CDC said anything over 60%. I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'm out here, but, you know. <laughs> but I'd rather drink it than spread it on my hands. But you know. Yeah, I got an email earlier from the Kentucky Distillers Association, and they're like, call to action. Hey, the FDA has reported that a 13-year-old kid has drank some hand sanitizer, and I was like, that's probably Alan's absence. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I did make my own hand, hand sanitizer. I bought a handle of um, – Everclear? Everclear, yeah. <laughs> and mix it with his own. Gum. I, I don't just help Justine. I'll help, I'll help the – You know, and – his own Everclear. It, it worked out great. So it's like I, I joke with the guys at work before I got furloughed. 
Uh, you know, I, can actually, I can actually pick this up and sanitize my hands and sanitize my throat at the same time. <laughs> well, <laughs> <nature>. Rick, Rick <laughs> Brenner, this would not be an ABV Network show if we did not make sure that we, we gave credos to everybody that deserves it. So if you get, if you get real desperate for hand sanitizer, Russell Creed will sell you a stovetop operating still system that will get you to the proof that you need it to be at, and he will give you all the support you need to make sure it's at the proof you need it to be at. I and know. You can have you can have your own kitchen hand sanitizing but manufactory. Russell, Sponsors of the show. The I like people. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Moonshinestillpro.com. You can find that That's at right. moonshinestillpro.com. Shine Russell's around. awesome. <laughs> Approved by Alan Bishop, Royce Neely, Adam Stubb, Lenny, and Lisa Wicker. And the ABV Network. Yes, thank That's you. Right. Yes, I like it. Yeah. Uh, so it's good. It's good. So good. The, the state of Missouri allows me to still up to 200 gallons of stuff in my house for personal consumption. Yeah, that's the just ATF, a weekend. Though, yeah, wow. I don't know where the hell that comes from because who the hell is going to use 200 gallons of liquor by themselves, you know? The legend. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a couple of us. The le the legend. <laughs> I think we could see who would do that. Yeah, the they legend. call it the uh, the Rick Brenner law. <laughs> <laughs> the Rick Brenner, Rick Brenner legacy law for Missouri. <laughs> that's gonna be that's gonna be the thing. We should we should jump on that as a network. Yeah. That should happen. Exactly. <laughs> the average American drinks one gallon a year. Rick Brenner drinks two hundred and twenty. <laughs> right. Hey. Steve, got... drinking, drinking, so you don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Steve. Question. I got one last. I got sure. one last question Go ahead, for everybody. Um, so while you know my job is to design distilleries and rickhouses and all the fun stuff associated with that, my passion before I got into this was beer, and in particular barrel aged beer. So I want to know from all the distillers, what is your favorite? Barrel aged beer that you've had that's been aged in your barrels. Oh, mm. this is a fun question. An IPA from Six Point in Brooklyn. Six Point, okay. Yeah. All right. We're, gonna we're working with a, a, a brewery out of Georgetown, and so we're sending some barrels to them to do that. But we haven't; it hasn't happened yet. I what I want to say though is I'm really pumped. Kentucky just passed another like I'm calling them the COVID nineteen laws, but it allows yep. the distillery to sell the beer in their gift shop uh, that has, you know, have been influenced by their whiskey barrels. So I thought that was a huge step. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's a big deal, man. Yeah, Kentucky yeah, is, I'm telling you, Kentucky's leading the charge on this stuff, which is great. So Hell come yeah. effective July 1st, I can direct ship to anybody in Kentucky. All right. Hell yeah. And Missouri. Be awesome. And Missouri. And beer. I can direct ship to beer too. Yes. It's a little known. You could also send it to Missouri. So the – <laughs> <laughs> the next year of uh donum day Bruce stillery's drunken unicorn will be in lee sinclair barrels and then donum day is also doing some uh, of their day shine which is a very short aged uh single malt whiskey which the owner drives around in a box truck through new albany um <laughs> they're doing that in a lee sinclair barrel so awesome wow yeah, I've actually got a four-year vertical, the Drunken Unicorn, and I got day shine this year when I went there. Hell yeah. Yeah, you got to support those guys. Richard's a good dude. Anyone else got a you favorite? You had some of the six point, didn't you? You had, you had some of the six point, didn't you? Yeah, I brought you that one can. Oh, that's right. That's right. Although we were still looking for the red-headed hooker that was done in the, in the widow <laughs> chain. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, do you got a favorite beer that's been in one of your barrels? Yeah, obviously, you know where it comes from. Uh, Stubborn German Brewery uh, yep. here in Waterloo. Chris does a ton of beer in our used barrels. Uh, he's, got a, he's got one that he does on coffee beans and vanilla beans that is absolutely killing our used bourbon barrels. Yeah. But he did a traditional smoked German Rausch beer in uh, a smoked rye whiskey barrel that we collaborated with Still 630 in, and it is killer absolutely killer killer okay yes uh that sounds good i like going to that place though it's kind of a hipster crowd I, I, i'm a little bit uh out of my element there just a little bit at least on a saturday night i was you the robinsons are disagreeing with me They're, it's it's good <laughs> you just gotta buy a 40 dollar pizza steve I, I tried the skinny jeans but it just doesn't work with me with my body style <laughs> 
Well, you know, it, we're it's it, it's not about judgment; it's about character. <laughs> it's character. <laughs> Lenny, who's uh, people got to be using your barrels for beer. You're in, you know, beer Mecca. So. Yeah, they are, but it's not the easiest because we're two hours from where they are typically. So uh, we get, we get some dedicated breweries or if I find a brewery that's really uh, inspires me, I'll just drive down and bring it to them. Um, so yeah, we, uh, Black Sky Brewery is one. Um, Eddie Line in town here, Elevation Brewery. Yeah. Okay. There's a bunch. Uh, because you were big into brewing i, I mean let's uh, that that was more than just kind of a hobby for you i mean you were you were you were big time into that yeah. so so I, you can talk their language so I, i'm sure the brewers like you you, you know what i'm gonna kind of uh flip this around and say uh i like me with regards to that because we're about to embark on a project where we're going to ferment uh malt barley base with britannomyces yeast and then ferment for two weeks and then transfer to barrels. So this is beer unhopped. And then we're going to let it sit in barrels all summer and then distill and mature. Okay. So I'm gonna Sign kinda... me up for that. Yeah. That yeah. Would... Maybe that's when I make a visit to your place when we can start <laughs> drinking some of that. Yeah. Sounds fantastic. All right. Other questions for our distillers? Anybody got anything else? All right, great. Well, I thank you guys for coming out tonight. I think it was a great session. I want to thank all of our distillers. So Lisa Wicker, Alan Bishop, Adam Stumpf, Lenny Eckstein, and Royce Neely. What a great job they did. Let's hear it for them. Great job from our distillers. I also want to thank my co-host, Christy Atkinson. We had a good time tonight, and hopefully you guys learned a lot and, and got to find out about the great distillers that we have that are friends of the network. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it, and shine on. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>